So my boyfriend and I are currently hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in California. It's extremely common to get hitches along the trail and most people who live in towns bordering the trail are fairly kind. They're also safe seeming folk. Emphasis on seeming. Well, today we found ourselves a little lost after trying to take a less traveled alternative trail to avoid the snow covered main trail. After lots of struggle and practically bushwhacking, we made our way down the hill and ended up accidentally on someone's property. This property is big. It's a large ranch with a few different buildings. We tried to skedaddle as fast as possible off the property, but one of the ranch dogs saw us and the owner came off in a golf cart. I explained that we accidentally got lost hiking and apologized, and he said that it happens often. He was super understanding. He asked us if we wanted a ride into town since he was about to leave anyways. Given how common hitching is on trail and how nice he was, we accepted and he drove us to town. Now, on the ride there, he told us that he used to be in the DEA and had participated in more shootouts than people fighting in the army. Weird, but okay, didn't think much of it. I noticed my boyfriend was really quiet though and thought that it was odd. But as soon as we hop out of the car, my boyfriend grabs our backpacks and tells me to check my phone. He had sent me an article about the guy that we had just got a ride from and how this guy was involved in his girlfriend's disappearance and a suspicious death on the ranch property not too long after. Apparently, his girlfriend went missing two weeks after signing property transfers of her ranch over to him. She was never found, and the suspicious death on the ranch was a worker who got killed by an ATV, but toxicology showed a meth overdose. Given his DEA background... I found that part especially suspicious. Also, he is on the sex offender registry for groping two women on a snowmobile tour apparently. So yeah, this article, it definitely shook me. My boyfriend and I are 100% okay, but yeah, like I said, just shook that we got a hitch from a possible murderer. And to be honest, after researching and reading everything, I think that he did it. Be careful who you get hitches from, I guess, even if they may seem friendly. In my teen years, think late middle school or high school, my family had a seasonal site at a campground. I spent most of my weekends during the summer and a couple of long holidays there as well. We had a small group of friends, mostly consisting of other kids of other seasonal campers, and befriending random one-off campers was not uncommon there. But one particular weekend, towards the end of the season, I met Mike. We quickly hit it off and became really good friends, playing and trading Pokemon on our Game Boys, hanging out at fires, playing some basketball, usual camp stuff. Mike's dad had invited a few family friends for the weekend, including Andrew. Andrew was a couple of years older than me. He could drive and had a big van that he attached a tent to through the trunk to have what we thought at the time was a pretty sweet setup. For the long weekend, we all hung out too, and we had an awesome time. Come Sunday, Mike, his dad, and most of their party left. But Andrew didn't. We hung out a little bit. He would brag about dirt bikes and ATVs and TVs and other stuff that he had an abundance of and kept implying that we should hang out sometime outside of camp. I said yeah, maybe or something along those lines knowing that typically camp friends were never more than camp friends. He eventually went home that Tuesday though and I didn't hear from him after that. He gave me his number. I told him that I didn't know mine off the top of my head, but I'd call him. Important for the rest of the story, but Andrew never knew more than my first name. My mum actually remarried, and I didn't have the same last name as her or my stepdad. Fast forward about a year, I'm using AOL Instant Messenger, and get a message from someone with the exact same name as me, with a number added. After a few reluctant messages, they reveal that it's Andrew. It was a bit off-putting, so I just blocked him. A second random message. 
him again, same name but increase the number on the screen name. We go through this for about a week and at this point I had blocked about eight of his fake accounts. It gets so bad that I create a new profile with a different email and am sure to not include any personal information, though I'm still pretty sure the original account had none included anyway. But about eight or nine months ago, no word from him, my family is eating dinner and there's a knock at the front door. My mum calls my name and says that apparently I have a, a friend visiting. And when I get there, it's Andrew. We politely ask him to leave and after about 15 or so minutes, he gives in and goes. Then the calls start. First from a number registered to him, which was screened with caller ID. Then restricted numbers, again ignored. Then from random numbers with local area codes. When he does get through screenings, usually from younger siblings, he acts like we are best friends, asking me to hang out, offers me free stuff, and I told him to stop calling, but he didn't. My mum tells him that I've moved in with my dad, but the calls kept coming anyway. Eventually, my mum tells him that she's going to call the police, and things die down a bit. One more year passes, and I'm back at the campground. I'm walking a lady friend that I had met that weekend back to her campsite, and this van pulls up alongside of us, and I hear someone call my name. I look over to see Andrew leaning out of his van again. We booked it and ran into the small patch of woods and got back to my family site and I tell my mum what's going on and she flips her lid. She ends up pounding on the campground owner's door, waking them up as it's about 11pm at this point. The police get involved and he's told to never contact me or show up at my house again. A family staying at the campground came over to talk to my parents the next morning and apparently they knew Andrew's parents and told them stories about episodes that he would have and he would need multiple people to hold him down until he would calm down because he would lose control and start acting sporadically and even violently. I saw him once after that too, about three years later, driving that very same van slowly out of an apartment complex that I had moved into. Nothing really ever came of it but I know that he saw me and the fact that I never saw him again makes me feel uneasy about what he was doing there that day to begin with. This is a, a nightmare that has stayed with me for years, and it really felt like something supernatural or paranormal was happening to me. Let me first start off though with the way that my apartment was set up. This is important too. So I rented an apartment out of a house. Landlord lived in half of the house. Our apartment was the other half. The living room looks like it used to be one big room, but was later divided by a set of French doors to make the bedroom area. So when facing the French doors in bed, I can see through the living room windows and across the rooms. I couldn't breathe though one day. I sprung awake in bed with a cold sweat, erratically breathing, shaking, and slight dizziness must be my blood sugar. Let me check. 155. No, I'm not low. I started panicking because I don't know what's wrong, only increasing my symptoms. I decided to go into the bathroom and splash my face with some water and use a washcloth to dry up. I hung it on the towel rack and I made my way back to the bedroom. But on the way back, I was stopped in my tracks. Suddenly, I couldn't move. It felt like in a dream when you're trying to walk or run and you feel like your legs are filled with cement. I started going down, desperately trying to drag myself across the floor to reach the foot of my boyfriend to wake him up for help, when all of a sudden I wake up in my bed, fuzzy. What? I guess that was a dream too. I quickly drifted back to sleep. I woke up again shortly after, as I often do in the middle of the night. I roll over to get comfy, and I face the living room window. The blinds are mostly closed, but are askew so that you can see out the bottom half of the window. And I see a silhouette, standing there. 
I roll back over to wake up my boyfriend in a panic, but before I can wake him, I woke up again. Another dream. I roll back over to the window again, and now I see a face in the window. The best that I can describe it, it kind of looked a bit like Darth Maul from Star Wars or that demon from Insidious. I rolled over to my boyfriend in a panic again, and the same thing happened. Before I can wake him up, I wake up from a dream, or so I thought. I rolled over to the window side again, and now it's in the living room. I wake up in bed again, thinking, Whoa, I've had dreams where I thought that I woke up, but never multiple times like this. I roll over, and now it's right outside the set of French doors. I wake up again, and now it's on the bedroom side of the doors. Again, now it's standing next to me. Again, now it's at the foot of my bed just staring at me. Again, still standing and staring. I repeat this process at least 10 or 15 more times. And each time an aura of dread filled the air, the feeling of primal fear was just terrible. It never really attacked me, but it did pull on and sharply scratch my legs a few times, it seemed. Every time that I woke up and I see it, it's still there. I start slapping myself, pulling on my hair, scratching myself, screaming at it, and anything that I could think of to try and wake myself up from these nightmares again and again and again. Eventually, I, I wake up after what seems like hours of this. I look around, and the room is empty. No Darth Maul demon anywhere to be seen. And it seems like I'm finally awake for real this time. Tears of fear... And relief come into my eyes when I realize that this horrible dream is over. I lay back down and I snuggled up to my boyfriend, being the big spoon, and decided to wake him up for some much needed comfort. I shake him awake and he slowly rolls over to face me. Except, it's not him. It's this thing. I go to scream, but before I can, I wake up again. The feeling of dread has completely vanished and... I slap myself a few times just to make sure that I'm awake this time, and it seems that I finally am. It's around 4 in the morning, and I am absolutely exhausted. But after that, I'm definitely not falling back asleep again. And the search of the house, that would have to wait until daylight hours. I was way too scared to leave the bed again, but once a few more hours had passed, I decided to get out of bed. I was wondering how much of the night was part of the dream. Did I really wake up in a cold sweat or check my blood sugar or even go to the bathroom to wash up at all? I checked my glucose monitor and there was the result, time stamped around when I remember getting up the first time. Then I checked the bathroom and the wet washcloth is hanging on the towel rack. So apparently I did wake up in a cold sweat, did test my blood sugar even went in to go to the bathroom. I have no explanation for what happened after this, but this much seems to have happened. If I did go to the bathroom, and if I did pass out on the floor, how did I wake up in bed that first time? I know that all this sounds nuts, but I think that maybe my body went back to bed after washing my face, but somehow I or my consciousness stayed behind in the bathroom or something? My body was asleep, but my soul was perhaps somewhere else. I've never experienced anything like this prior or after, no matter how many times I've tried to replicate it. But there must be a, a logical medical explanation for this, or maybe I had a reaction to something, but I don't know. It was unlike any nightmare that I've had before, and I've had them frequently. This one, though, just felt so different. This isn't the first time that I've experienced something paranormal either. I'm fairly convinced that my childhood home was haunted or some kind of paranormal sensitivity runs on my mother's side of the family. My childhood home is also my mother's childhood home. My grandma lives with us too. We're upstairs and she's downstairs. And her mother, my great-grandmother, lived there as well and slept in my grandmother's current bedroom but passed on before I was born. Also, before I was born, the house was only one level. My great-grandmother who passed, she was blind and mostly deaf toward the end. And 
It's not uncommon for patients like this to hallucinate, auditorily, visually, or tactically, and she always saw and heard people coming through the walls, windows, heard scratching and banging, felt people touching her. Again, it's probably nothing, but considering the other experiences, I don't know, there might be some validity, even if it is exaggerated. My grandmother frequently feels someone sitting down on the foot of her bed at night. When my mother and father were first dating and he spent the night, once he woke up to see a woman rocking back and forth in a rocking chair knitting. When he described what she looked like to my mum, it sounded a lot like her grandmother. My mum claims to be able to astral project, not on purpose, it just happens apparently. And in these dreams, she can fly around and even into houses houses that we've never been in, only for her to confirm that it's what the house looked like after visiting or being invited into the neighbor's house. Also, some other first-hand experiences that I've had in this place is that my bed would randomly shake, as if there's a sort of small earthquake going on, or if a really big truck rolled past the house or something, but there was never anything there, and no earthquakes either. I lived in New York, so earthquakes weren't a regular thing by any means. I felt taps on my shoulder from behind when alone in my kitchen. Once I woke up in the middle of the night to grab some water from the kitchen and realized that my dog was growling. Then this shadow figure ran right through me. There was also this time that almost every picture in the house of a, a late relative all fell off the walls at once. And well... I know that this all sounds like complete BS. All of this probably does, but sometimes I dream of the future and not anything major, like I'm walking down a road I've never been on before. Then within the next few days, I'm in an area that looks exactly the same as my dream. I know that this could be something else like deja vu, but sometimes I wake up with injuries that I'd suffer in a dream, like scratches and bruises. But I'm also super clumsy, so that could be an explanation for that at least. Also, for whatever reason, streetlights frequently go out when I walk under them. And I get this feeling and can sort of tell when one will. I'm not sure if it's related to all of this, but it's super creepy, let me tell you. Anyway, I just wanted to get this off my chest and thank you for listening, even if you don't believe in all this and you don't believe my words. It's nice to be able to have my paranormal TED talk and just get this all out. A few days ago, my girlfriend and I, the young 20s, were on the home stretch of a big road trip with our dog. As it had been a while since we last stopped, we pulled into a rest stop off of a freeway to stretch our legs and have Doggo take a, a dump. When we pulled into the rest stop, there were no cars and three big semi-trucks parked in a line. Immediately, my girlfriend got out to go into the next room. I leashed up the dog and stood next to the car and, as she was walking towards the entry door, I thought that I heard someone yell behind me. To my surprise, it was a trucker in the driver's seat of his truck with the window rolled down, trying to get my attention. Now... I'm generally a pretty friendly person towards all people, whether they seem shady or not, generally willing to help a hand. Behind me in the truck was an older gentleman, large with grey hair and sunglasses. His truck was so loud that I really couldn't hear what he was saying, so I yelled back what. The trucker yelled something inaudible three more times as I asked him what, while shaking my head and holding up my heads to inform him that I couldn't hear him. At this point, he seemed visually annoyed that I said what four times, okay, which, okay, that's understandable. I wanted to see what the deal with this guy was, so I walked halfway between the car and his passenger side truck. What did you say? I asked. Can you help me look for my phone? I lost it somewhere, the trucker said. At this point, I was super caught off guard as... This had all unfolded within the 20 to 30 seconds that we parked at the rest stop. To me, it was weird that a, a trucker was asking a random person stopping at a rest stop to help look for their phone, but maybe he just wanted me to call it. 
Where did you lose it? I asked. Uh, I lost it in my truck. Can you come up here and help me look for it? The trucker replied in a really unnerving tone. In that moment, I was really sketched out. I thought that I was about to be abducted. Phone call I could do, but no way was I about to get into his trucker's cab to look for his phone. Yeah, I'm good, I said sternly, but half-heartedly as I almost thought that this guy was joking with me. After a few moments, the trucker then says, You won't help me look for it? My adrenaline was pumping, so I yelled back, Get out of here, in a threatening tone, knowing that I had nothing to defend us should something go wrong. I put Doggo back in the car and pulled out my phone to pretend that I was calling the cops. While he slowly drove and then stopped again to ask if I was going to help, I then screamed again, No, get out of here, I'm calling the cops. And after that reply... He stepped on the gas and exited the freeway. I stood and watched when finally my girlfriend exited the rest stop, wondering why I looked like I'd just seen a ghost. I don't know if it was an overreaction, but it sketched me out that he asked me to get into his truck like that. So, the hubby and I worked together at the time that this happened drove to and from work together daily. Note too that we had a, a pet cat named Sammy, but nobody else lived with us and we owned our home, so no landlords coming in while we were out or anything like that. Now one day, we come home from work and there is on the floor, in the middle of the kitchen, an egg. One single egg, no cracks and in perfect condition. The weird part? We had no eggs, none in the fridge, didn't eat them often, so we had those frozen egg whites that come in a cardboard carton, no actual eggs, and hadn't had any in the house for a real long time. We scratched our heads about that, threw the egg away, and that was that. Until the next day, we come home and there's another egg, again right in the middle of the kitchen floor. Now... We're getting freaked out. Once was weird enough, but twice? We considered cracking this one open, but we decided against that and we just threw it out. Weirdly too, it never seemed to happen again. And to this day, many years later, we mentioned the time that Sammy laid eggs in the kitchen, but have yet to come up with any sort of plausible explanation for what it was. And the whole thing was just bizarre. I was tree planting near Smithers, BC, about an hour and a half into the mountains on dirt roads. I've really tried my best to forget that this incident ever happened, because I just cannot find a way to rationalize any of it. So, it was almost midnight and I was trying to sleep in my tent. My tent was near a bunch of standing dead trees that would creak when the wind picked up. It was a very loud and distinct sound, and on this particular night, it was dead silent and still though. I started to hear sticks cracking and steps being taken that seemed to slowly get closer over the course of about maybe 15 minutes. It was loud enough that I was certain that there was a bear approaching my tent, and it got so close that it had to be no further than 15 feet from it. Cracking sticks and... Padding around the forest floor, I decided to yell out very loudly, but there was silence. I was answered with nothing but deafening silence. No sound of the creature fleeing or doing anything at all. I just sort of sat there in silence, scared to move, trying to rationalize to no conclusion. About 20 minutes of dead silence later, I heard the eeriest, unnatural, and unexplainable noise that I've ever heard. It was the exact same timber and volume, and just basically the same sound as the trees outside creaking, but instead of being a sort of regular creak, it began, and then held the exact same note of a creak for a full five seconds or even longer. It was like an unnatural drone that was obviously not a tree creaking. 
Mind you, there was not a hint of wind or any other trees creaking as per usual. I don't know what that was, but what I'm trying to say is that it was unnatural and weird. I got barely any sleep that night, and the next day was really tough. I just tried to forget about it, but I never did make the connection that skinwalkers are known to imitate sounds like that until maybe a few weeks ago. This happened in July of 2022, and I don't know, it was a weird experience. I'm not saying that it was a skinwalker, but it was strange. If anyone has had any similar experiences or has any ideas of what this could have been, then I would sure love to hear it. This story, we have to rewind a bit until last summer. Uh, that was the night of August the 12th, specifically, and it was the night that the meteor shower was happening. With the intention of watching the meteor shower, my partner and I packed a towel and some takeout dinner and headed to a huge park in our city. In this park, there's this big wooded area that we thought was ideal to watch the sky, since it was almost in pitch darkness. We had to use our phone flashlights to navigate it, and chose a place to lay down a towel, just so you can picture how dark it was. We get there, we turn off the flashlight, and I play some chill music on my phone. We were both looking at the sky, but if we looked around us, it was completely pitch black. The only light was in the horizon line. Now, it may seem irrelevant at this point, but I was wearing a sundress that had to be tied around the waist, and I untied it to be more comfortable in the position that I was laying. After 5 or 10 minutes of unsuccessfully trying to see a shooting star, I lower my sight and start taking notice of our surroundings. And to my left, my boyfriend is sitting to my right, still looking at the sky. I notice some movement. I try to focus my eyes on it. I only see a brief outline, but I can tell that there's somebody or something approaching us. My first thought was, oh, there's a dog, but... For some reason I feel unsettled and I cannot take my eyes off of it. As it comes closer and I can see more of it, the distant lights in the horizon line sort of light this thing up and I tell my partner that there's something coming towards us. I think it might be a dog. Before I even finish the sentence though, it hit me. It wasn't a dog. It's a man, but... He's crawling on all fours in a sort of animalistic way with his chest close to the ground. My boyfriend, he saw it too, bolted onto his feet. I felt paralyzed in fear while he urged me to get up. He said to me, I'll grab our stuff, you have to get up. I was trying to tie my dress back up, but I was so nervous that I couldn't. Come on, we need to leave, he said. He took my hand and we started rushing through the woods towards the lit part of the park. I couldn't stop looking back. We were both very shaken up by it, but we eventually got out of there and I was so thankful that I wasn't alone in the woods that night. I would like to tell you guys about an unsettling experience that I had about uh, maybe 10 years ago now in the fall. I was born in and still live in Lewisbury, PA. My younger years were spent back near the old observatory, around Moore's Mountain Road and Observatory Drive, if you know the place. But even then I could sense that this area was a little bit off. The woods were just not quite right. Open fields seemed, I don't know, like eerie. The roads never seemed to go the exact places you thought they did. Moore's Mountain Church boasted Spook Hollow, which was a logging road that just kind of padded out that reeked of being creepy. But anyway, most nights I will drive down to New Cumberland for a cold beer and some darts, and one night in October of 2012, it was no different. On the return trip, not long after midnight, I was on Route 382, headed eastwards, Lewisbury. As I was approaching John Brennanman's place up on the right, just before Brennanman Drive, I saw someone walking towards me um, along the side of the road. 
True, it was late, but it was rather mild for October, so it wasn't out of the question that somebody might be walking along the road. But what was odd is that he was very tall, 6'6 or taller at least, and really, really thin. In the few seconds that I was looking at him, I noticed that he seemed to be dressed all in black, with black pants, a, a tight black trench coat, very, very dark skin, and also short dark hair. He was either limping or having trouble walking. As I sort of debated slowing down, I mean, maybe somebody had had an accident, he then, all of a sudden, dropped down to all fours and quickly scampered across the road in front of me. He has a face that was, as I said, coal black, but now that I get a better look at him, it's sort of a cross between what I can only describe as human and canine. And then, he was gone. When I got home, I hadn't really thought much about it, but over the next day or two, it really started to give me the creeps. Obviously, I didn't say anything to anyone for a few days, but then I told a few close friends. Being self-employed and fearing derision, I was reticent to make much ado about it. Although I have always been an enthusiast of the paranormal, cryptozoology, ghosts and such, I've always been a, a dyed-in-the-wool skeptic, I guess you could say. I can't explain what I saw or begin to postulate what it was. I only know that I saw it and it creeps me out. I did do some research and the closest that I came to was a picture was like one in Texas, a, a stilt walker, which, yeah... You can have a look at that online if you'd like to get a bit of an idea of what it looked like. This happened about nine years ago and sometimes comes to my mind. Whenever it does, it always creeps me out. So, I was on an adult dating site, one of the fetish types. I know, don't judge me. I just was looking for some fun. Anyway, I was stupid and gave out more information than I probably should have. I was chatting with a guy. He asked me at some point what I did for work. At the time, I was working in a McDonald's, so I told him. He asked which one, and I stupidly told him which one it was. We chatted off and on. We hadn't been chatting for too long, and I also stupidly gave him my phone number at some point. He would talk about how he wanted to meet me on my break and have some fun on my break. I told him, no thanks. I don't bring my lifestyle to my job. Anyway, I checked my messages just before I was due to clock out of work. And luckily I did, because he mentioned that he was at my job and told me that he ordered a Big Mac meal. I was like, oh, okay, well... Don't expect me to do anything with you. I'm not interested. He then got upset and apparently wasn't accepting that I wasn't interested. I was also scared because I hadn't sent him a face picture of myself, but I had never received one from him either. I really wasn't too interested in him, so I decided that I didn't need a face picture since I likely wasn't going to meet up with him anyway. His interests weren't what I was looking for and... I have a hard time straight up saying that I'm not interested and just slowly started to ghost whoever I had no interest in really. Now luckily, I hadn't told him my work schedule so he didn't know that I was about to clock out. So I, after clocking out, told one of my managers that I was on a dating site and some guy just showed up to my work and I have no idea what he looks like and that I was going to hang out in the back in the break room for a bit. Luckily, she didn't judge me and was like, oh, okay. So I waited for about half an hour before I left. I didn't have a car at the time and I had to walk home as well and I was afraid that he would see me and try to pick me up in his car. Luckily, no one followed me, so I seemed to be in the clear. But it creeps me out that some random person just decided that he would show up to my job and expect me to want to meet up with him like that. It was foolish of me to walk home that night too, I mean, anything could have happened. But this whole experience opened my eyes thankfully and made me more aware of the information that I give out to strangers. I've definitely learnt my lesson and I won't be doing that again. 
That's for sure. I, a 33-year-old female, was in my early 20s. At the time, I had a female dog named Nina, a boxer. She passed away when she was eight from lung cancer, and I miss her a lot. Nina, though, was very energetic, so I took her for long walks around the neighborhood, usually at the end of the day at around 4 to 6 p.m., when it wasn't too hot, but not dark either. But one thing you must know about Nina as well is that she loved people, she did not get along with other dogs, but every time she saw somebody walking by us, she would shake her tail and wanted to get closer and ask for pets. Now one day, we went on our usual walk. Everything was fine for most of it. I saw a few other dog tutors walking their dogs and an old couple sitting in front of their house chatting. And then when we were alone, Nina suddenly started growling. One thing I should mention too is that I've graduated in biology and specialize in animal behavior. At the time this story happened, I was finished college, so I used to pay a lot of attention to my dog's behavior and had quite a lot of knowledge on dog behavior because it was my favorite subject in the area. Dogs can see movement much better than us, so things like an eyebrow raise or a little bit of tension on the shoulders, they can easily pick up on it. So, of course, a, a dog growling doesn't sound that weird, I know, but Nina did growl to other dogs and cats when she saw them, but this was different. It was very low and all the fur on her back was up. Her entire behavior was of alarm. And then I noticed that she was looking back while growling. So I looked behind me briefly in the distance, like a, a block away, I saw a man. This made me even more alert because Nina never growled to anyone in the street before. She never stopped walking by my side or tried to pull away, but she kept this low growl going and kept looking at this guy. I started to freak out a bit and turned to the next block. She stopped for a second, but when we reached the next corner, she started growling again and he was there again. He didn't try to talk to me, call me, and, or anything like that. His expression was very serious too, kind of emotionless I guess. I kept walking in random patterns and he was always just there though. Which means that that man was definitely following me. At some point our distance started to shrink and Nina's growling was getting stronger. So when I turned the next corner I just started running while he couldn't see me. I ran about maybe four blocks in the direction of an area that I knew had more traffic and people around. I stopped to get my breath and looked behind me. He was far away, right in the corner where I had started running. Just there, standing and looking at me. Nina was looking at him too, still with her alarm posture. After a minute, he turned around and went in the same direction that he had come from. And Nina finally relaxed. I kept paying attention to Nina's behavior the entire way back to my house later, but she was just her normal happy self. Now, I've told this story to my parents and a few neighbors, and no one seemed to know of any man that looked like him. I never did see him again either, and Nina never behaved like that again, ever. So I guess I'll never know who he was or why he was following me, but... I definitely do not regret trusting Nina's instincts. I mean, if it hadn't have been for her, I don't think I would have even known that the man was behind me. I guess the lesson here is that people need to pay attention to their pet's behaviors as much as they can. It's not about a supernatural sixth sense or anything. They can actually feel, see, and hear things better than us, and there's no behavior that happens for no reason. There is always a reason. So, stay safe, everyone. We live in a small town in the Midwest. She works at an old, old elementary school as a music teacher. We also live across the street from a cemetery where we've both seen a spooky ghost. I'm still kind of skeptical, if I'm being honest. 
But when she started working at the school, she came home with a really odd story about how her pencil cup is always thrown on the ground when she comes into work in the morning. She thought that it was just a begrudged custodian at first, then she blamed the cup, then the desk, and then maybe the floor wasn't level. But it happened every single night and she'd find her pens tossed everywhere and the cup somewhere on the ground. Finally, she just stopped talking about it and eventually the custodian complained to the administrators that my wife was throwing her pens on the floor and leaving the mess for him. The pen cup thing still happens on almost a daily basis, but when my wife was a, a practicing a hymn alone in her classroom after school, apparently the piano made a sound as if, in her words, someone sat right on the piano. She said that it was brief, obnoxious, and a burst of piano notes, and then just silence. She said that she slowly walked out and pushed it out of her mind because... Who knows, maybe there was a rat or something in the actual piano. But the last thing is the scariest to me, and the school has a sort of second story that was never finished. It's used as a huge storage attic. It's accessible from a locker, ladder, sort of outside the building. Other teachers experienced a similar thing, but my wife didn't really believe it until last night. She was giving a private lesson to a high school girl that wants to learn opera, the girl left and while my wife was gathering her stuff to head home, she heard someone running full speed from the inaccessible side of the attic thing towards the ladder side. She heard the running from one end to the other and it was inhumanely fast. And then nothing. She said that she was actually scared by this and she ran to her car in the end and... As weird as it sounds, she enjoys these experiences. I, on the other hand, am kind of afraid for her. But what do we do about it? And can we even do anything about it? Let me know. So, I've always been somewhat of a believer in the paranormal but didn't buy the whole thing of spirits and demons were common. That is, until I had some things happen to me as an adult. As a child, I experienced a few things that were also witnessed by my mother, so I knew that there was some truth to it all. About four years ago, I experienced something one night that has changed my life forever. At first, I was pretty excited over what had happened, but then, like the flip of a switch, it all just sort of turned dark, very dark. You see, I was investigating my own experience, doing everything that I could or had seen on TV. And yes, I know now that that was a huge mistake. But at the time, I was trying to get answers and I was willing to do anything that I could try to get them. Even something that I had always sworn that I would never do, attempting to use a spirit board. I was doing all of my investigation by myself, another mistake, and I was going to the cemetery where it all started by myself at all hours of the night, another huge mistake. One day though, I got the bright idea of downloading the spirit board app on my phone. The first time that I used it, I got just what I expected, garbage, but I didn't give up, and after several attempts, I made one more attempt and this time things were a bit different. I was sitting at my kitchen table, turned on the app and started to ask questions. The answers were coming quickly and accurately, and I thought to myself, wow, maybe this time it's actually working. I was obviously still very skeptical about all this and thought to myself, I'm going to debunk this thing and bust it as fake. I asked if they could see me. The answer was yes. I asked for its name. I was given Mariah. I then asked where I was sitting. The answer was the kitchen table. I asked what I was wearing. It answered correctly. I then asked, where are you at? It answered with next door and cellar. I thought to myself, ah, I have you now. So I replied with, oh, so you're in the red brick one story next door then? It responded with no. I asked, which house are you in then? And the answer made my blood run cold. 
It replied with grey two-story on the corner, abandoned. Now, when you look out my kitchen window, there is a grey two-story on the corner of another street, and it's been abandoned for several years. It also has a cellar, not a basement. I continued to have conversations with this spirit board app for several months. One night I started at 1 in the morning and I didn't stop until almost 7 in the morning and it only felt like 20 minutes had went by. And this Mariah could tell me things about myself that nobody could know about. It would tell me about calls that I had when years ago I was a police officer and what I had seen or felt. My haunting became very horrifying for several years and I still deal with it daily and nightly even. An investigation was done at my home and they got the name Mariah as well, who they said was actually a succubus that was apparently attached to me. I stopped using the spirit app a, a long time ago but I am still dealing with the very real issues of using one and apparently not closing the door when done using it by myself and so on and so forth. Now, I'm here to tell you, just because you use one and you have no issues, doesn't mean that your time isn't coming. And when it does, honestly, I, I feel sorry for what you're going to be dealing with. Please, whatever you do, take this seriously and use with extreme caution. I wished that I was more careful myself. Way back when I was around 14 to 15, many years ago, a group of us would always hang out together, around 8 or 10 of us, sneaking around alleyways etc, looking for cool little places to explore. One evening, not far from where we lived, we found this small walled off area that had an open patch of land and a lock up garage. The open land was big enough to have a large tree trunk laid out as a kind of bench and also various metal bars, oil cans were strewn around. It was a bit of a mess but it also had an old JCB digger in the center of this piece of land. The digger took up most of the space to give you an idea of the size of it but we were all climbing around on this thing when suddenly a man appears in the driver's seat just sort of popped up out of nowhere but the weirdest part is that he was completely black and white with a sort of slight glow to him. We all saw him, screamed and panicked, jumped off the JCB and hid around the tree trunk, barrels, etc. And he just sat there, motionless for maybe 20 seconds or so. And then we watched as he just vanished. What I find quite unique about this though is that there was a relatively large group of us who all saw the same thing. We started sharing what we had seen and we were all in a hurry to talk over each other describing the exact same stuff. All of these years later, we still talk about it too and the story has never changed. It was us just playing around and this black and white guy appeared and then just vanished again. And that's weird to me because whenever I've watched paranormal stuff, it never seems to be that large of a group of people or all see something at the same time. Sadly, we had no cameras or phones back then, or we surely would have had several pictures of what we saw. But that's my story. I still do remain a bit of a skeptic when others talk about seeing ghosts, and I don't know why that is, but this experience, it's definitely opened my mind to things beyond. To start, my mum has two dogs. One is a pit lab mix and the other is an Australian shepherd mix. They like to frequently get out. It's primarily her pit lab. His name is Big. If I remember, the previous owner named him that because of Biggie Smalls and the Australian shepherd is named Luna. Their sweet dogs wouldn't hurt a soul unless they had to, I'm sure. But like I said, they frequently get out of the house and like to run around the property. Big is the only one that actually gets out. He's broken windows, window screens, chewed through doors even. He's got a lot of anxiety issues when it comes to being in the house alone. 
and Luna simply follows him. He's now medicated and has gone through some training, and is definitely not as bad as it used to be, but it's still a problem, and my mum has had the police called on her for the issue once or twice. Mum has always been scared that he's going to get shot because she lives in a place hunters frequently visit, and pit bulls have this sort of stigma around them, and she's also scared for the same thing with Luna because she has really long legs and is scared that someone might mistake her for a deer one day. Luna though is a fine dog on her own and rarely runs off if she doesn't have a leash on. She's mostly a follower. Anyways, this next bit is from my mum's own account and that of my mum's neighbour, Erica. She usually calls my mum if the dogs get out and since they know her they have no issues going to her personally. However, when they got out the other day, my mum was able to wrangle them up with Erica's help. But then later that night, my mum had gotten a call from Erica saying that the dogs were out again. My mum was confused because they were both at the foot of her bed asleep. My mum even sent her a photo of them together on the bed. Erica ended up calling my mum about it, thinking that it was a joke, but it wasn't. And my mum was being honest with her. Erica sent a photo back to my mum, and one of the dogs looked exactly like Big. He has a very specific birthmark above his nose that looks like a, sort of like a wonky T-shape, I guess. And the photo looked exactly like Big, from the birthmark to even the demeanor from afar, and everything was really freaky. There was even a point where my mum thought Erica was joking, and she could do nothing but reassure my mum that it wasn't a joke. Erica made the absolute worst decision that she could have, though, in my opinion and decided to open her front door, and according to her, the imposter dog gave her the most evil look a dog could possibly give. She said the dog growled at her, showed their teeth. My mum even heard it over the phone. This prompted my mum to race over to Erica's house to see the dog herself, and sure enough, there he was, barking at Erica's door after she had went inside. It was also a dumb decision on my mum's part, but... After the encounter firsthand, she raced home and called me crying about the ordeal, which is very unlike her. Apparently, another neighbor, his name is Dean, called the cops because he said that he saw Luna out and was terrorizing his chickens. Now, the rest of this story is from me and what I experienced. I live an hour away from my mum, so I hop in my car and get to her house. Three or four cop cars are parked down that rural street in the middle of pretty much nowhere, Ohio. It was a bizarre thing to see, honestly, but when I walked up, cops were questioning my mum about her dogs with Erica and the other cops, I'm assuming, were looking around the area for these dogs. I could hear my mum's dogs whining through the front door at the commotion. They were even looking through the window, too. Clearly not vicious or anything, and the cops concluded eventually that it wasn't my mum's dogs. They left eventually, and when I went to take Luna out on the leash, I made sure to stay with her and double-check myself that nothing was out there that could hurt her. But when I looked into the back field of my mum's house, I saw them. Two dogs that looked almost exactly like Luna and Big, standing side by side, staring at me. Not moving at all. Their tails weren't even wagging. Needless to say, I was freaked out. Luna saw them and freaked out. In fact, I've never seen her react that way before. I mean, teeth out, fur up and all that. Seriously, she's never acted like that. I was even afraid to go near her out of fear that she might hurt me. But eventually she walks towards me, growling and baring her teeth. She let me unhook her and take her inside. But she didn't leave the back door for the rest of the night. Like she was waiting for something to happen. They stood there for a really long time. It had to have been at least a few minutes because my mum called the cops and reported it. Some were still in the area, but eventually they walked off. Admittedly, I, I really don't know a lot about dogs, and even though I've been around these two for years, I know for a fact that they weren't acting like dogs. I mean, the way they stared at me and the way they stood so still with no emotion from what I could tell, it really honestly scared me. It's been a few days and they still haven't found these dogs. 
Dean is still unconvinced that it wasn't my parents' dogs, and I stayed with my mum for a day or two to comfort her. Now, I believe in Wendigos, and I believe in skinwalkers and the paranormal, but never truly experienced anything like this myself. But if it's anything like this, then I don't want to experience anything like this ever again. I've never even experienced anything weird on my parents' property until this. I know skinwalkers will take their prey and use their corpse or whatever to try and lure people to meet a deadly fate, but her dogs are alive and well, and those, well, things had tails, so in my opinion, skinwalker is not much in the question. But it's just weird that two dogs that look exactly like my mum's dogs are standing side by side in the field like that. Maybe it was a coincidence, I don't know. Maybe it was just two vicious dogs and they happen to look like my mum's dogs after all. One with the same unique birthmark and the same distinct features and everything. Or, I don't know, maybe it was something else. My parents and I lived in a little old house in a sleepy neighborhood for about seven years. During that time, my parents fought almost constantly, bad fights too, physical hitting and shoving and dragging even. They acted positively demonic when they were fighting and it was almost every day for hours on end. We noticed other things happened in the house too. And my dad would wake up to find various things sort of unplugged when they had been firmly set the night before. We had an unfinished basement and every time that I went down there at night to get the laundry, I literally had to pray to God because the feeling of intense dread and terror was just so strong. I really don't know how to describe that, but it was just terrifying. It was almost like when I had my back to the room while digging into the dryer or whatever, I felt like I was prey for an animal. One time during lunch, my grandpa was over and we all froze because the sound from the basement of a large garbage bag being dragged across the concrete was echoing throughout the whole house. Not falling, not slipping, but dragging. We all got real quiet and for some reason just ignored it and went back to talking. Around the time that my parents got therapy for their issues and were rebuilding their bond with each other and me, I fell into a deep depression at that time. About a year after that, the nightmare started. Horrible, horrible dreams almost every night, nearly always involving some dark evil being who wanted to hurt me. It would whisper to me and say that I should end my own life, and I'd always wake up panicking and flip my light on. The feelings of dread started to intensify, and I'd find myself up the entire night to avoid my dreams. I remember one particular night, I was alone in the living room, lamps on, watching a Hallmark show and using my headphones, and out of nowhere, I was struck with the feeling that I was in danger. I tore off my headphones and paused my show, and I just sort of sat there on the couch. I didn't hear anything, I didn't see anything, but I have never felt such bone-crushing fear in my life. I thought that I was going to choke and die or vomit from the nausea and tension that I felt. I was completely frozen in fear. And then, suddenly, just like that, it passed. The last big thing was a couple of months before we decided to move to a different house. I had never told my parents what I'd experienced yet, but I woke up at about 2.30 in the morning... I sleep with my dog on my bed, 17 pounds of goofy little guy, super gentle, has never growled at anything, he just plays pretty much. All except this time. I heard one of my parents cross my door to go to the bathroom, as they often did at night, but I never recalled seeing a light come on or the door shut, though I blamed it on my half-sleep state, I guess. But as soon as I saw that shadow pass under my door, and heard the steps, my beautiful docile little dog woke up and leaped on top of me. He growled the most vicious snarl that he has ever made and he was just staring at my door. His heckles were up and he was definitely protecting me from something. 
I still thought that maybe he'd been surprised, even though it scared me. But I woke up the next morning and asked my parents if they'd been up last night. They both said no. And at that, I was really scared. Exactly on moving day, the night before that we were to pack up once and for all, I had the worst dream ever. Invisible things were hitting me and throwing furniture and saying, you can't leave. I woke up crying so hard that I started having an asthma attack. I don't even really have asthma. But the first night in our new home, there were no nightmares. I slept peacefully. We've lived here for a year now, and I've had no fear, no dread, no bad dreams, nothing. And it's amazing. But I want to clarify that my family and I, we're highly religious. We believe it's best not to speak about demons because they like being spoken of. I also wish to clarify too that we owned absolutely nothing that would draw them. No demonic media, antiques or anything. And yet, I just know that we left something behind back there. I still feel the tightness in my chest every time that we drive by that place too. It's a terrible place. A really sad, lonely and dark place. Somewhere I will never return. This happened a while ago, but I still remember it vividly, although I'm still not entirely sure what I saw that night. Quite a few years ago, my friends from home were all back from college over Thanksgiving break. We ended up planning a girls' night at one of my friends' houses, and all planned to sleep over since we would be drinking and staying up late anyways. I had a little bit of a cold and my nose was stuffy, but I decided to go anyways. This was before COVID was a thing, of course, but... Throughout the night, my energy started to decline and I started feeling more and more sick. I couldn't breathe it all out of my nose anymore and since it was late, I decided to just take some cold meds and suck it up for the night and drive home early in the next morning. But once we went to bed, I realized quickly that I couldn't breathe well while laying down and it was uncomfortable for me to try and sleep and not disrupt the other girls with my sniffing and loud breathing. At about 3.30 in the morning, I decided that I just couldn't take it anymore, so I quietly got up to leave. I lived two towns away, and it was super dark outside. It was chilly out, but not super cold, where you sort of needed a winter coat or anything like that. About halfway home, I saw what looked like a person in all black creeping around the side of a house. As I got closer, I noticed too that were wearing a black ski mask to cover their face. Again, it was chilly but not that cold outside. As I began to drive closer to the house and the person saw my car and I saw them duck behind the trash can on the side of the driveway, I drove by and realized pretty quickly that what I had just seen was creepy but I felt super sick and delusional and I just wanted to get home so I didn't drive back to look again. I thought about calling the cops, but I didn't even know the addresses of the houses or what was actually going on, to be honest. When I got home, though, I slept on my parents' recliner couch so that I could breathe better and I got some rest. In the morning, I told my mum about what I saw on the drive home, and she didn't seem worried at all and told me that it was probably just someone taking out their trash late at night. And I guess she could be right, but I still wonder why he was wearing a ski mask and seemed to hide the second that he noticed me, about to pass the house. Days and weeks later, I was constantly looking up the news in that town to see if there had been any reported break-ins or robberies, but I never did find anything. It still creeps me out, though, just thinking about it. And who knows, maybe that night, me being sick and coming back when I did, stopped something really horrible from happening. Around a year ago, I got a message on LinkedIn from a fellow networker. It was a man with a very little information. If any, it's really vague. No profile picture and over 500 plus connections. His name is also very generic and it isn't easily distinguishable. 
same with the job that he has. It's very generalized. I was new to LinkedIn though, just started out in the professional world and was open to talking to anyone that was within the realm of my degree. I get a message from him asking if I'm related to Mrs. and gave the last name. He says that he went to a specific high school which checks out where this woman that he named used to be a student librarian and would have seen hundreds to thousands of kids when she was there and employed. I said that it was my dad's ex-wife and I'm not related to her but she no longer has that last name anymore. He told me that her and I had a lot in common with working at libraries and I smile reacted to his message. We aren't connections nor friends on LinkedIn nor anywhere. He tells me that it's an honor to know me to which I also emoji react and don't respond. We chatted for a bit after that, with me giving up no new info than what was in my profile. For the weeks and months to come, he'll send every time that I'm on, he's on. Any time that I update anything, he's the first to comment and send me a message. It's almost like he's never offline in fact. The last encounter was two days ago when I updated about my new job at a medical group and he messaged me saying that he was proud of me and congrats. I said thanks, but then he said, I looked up the name of the place, there's a lot, which location are you at? To which, I have not and will never respond. I've brought this up to people in my life and they say that this is what LinkedIn is for, but to me, this is creepy and borderline stalkerish with zero way to verify who this man really is. Last year in December, my mum was hospitalized and I was staying at my sister's house, a spare room in the basement. Everything was going pretty okay for the first few nights, but on night three, everything changed. I couldn't sleep well and it didn't help that I kept hearing weird noises too. There's a closet in the spare room and that night I could hear movement from it where there should have been none. It almost sounded like, I don't know, someone or something was moving something heavy and dragging it around in there. The closet isn't very big mind you so that's what made it even weirder. But I just thought that it was my mind playing tricks on me even though I'm a believer, and I've had so many encounters with the paranormal now. I just didn't want to believe it, I guess. I was already going through a lot and was scared that my mum was going to die. I didn't want another thing, you know, to have to worry about. Anyway, sometimes the dragging noise in the closet would stop for a little bit and then continued. Other times, there would be a scraping sound outside the tiny basement window. It didn't sound like an animal, it sounded almost metal I guess, like a, a shovel or something was scraping at the window. It was weird, but whatever. I had fallen asleep at some point, but I woke up in an almost completely dark room, even though there was a nightlight on. That puzzled me for a moment, but I was really scared, but my fear intensified when I saw a, a very tall man standing in the corner by the window. The man was so tall that his head was almost touching the ceiling, in fact. He had torn up clothes on, like as if he'd been through some hard times, maybe. It looked like he had dark, long hair and a long beard that matched his hair color. He had his arms crossed against his chest, and then the most terrifying thing happened. He turned his head and looked at me. We made eye contact for several long seconds that felt like an eternity, before, he literally just vanished, and the room suddenly became way less dark. I looked at my phone to see that it was four in the morning. I didn't go back to sleep, I didn't see the man again, but I could almost feel like someone was watching me. Later on, I told my sister what happened, and she was freaked out. She told me not to tell her husband or daughter though because they'd be too scared to go downstairs again which is understandable really. I've been down in the basement several times now since then but I've never seen the man again nor have I. I don't know who or what he was but I hope that I never have to see him again. That much I'm certain of. When 
I was in fourth or fifth grade. My best friend was given a Ouija board for her birthday. We loved that thing too. For months, we would sit there with it after school, talking with what we thought were our deceased relatives. I now know that that was a lie. You can only really communicate with the demonic through this medium, or at least that's what I believe. Eventually, a spirit wouldn't leave her board though. His name was Steve, which is kind of ironic because that is also our creepy neighbor's name. Anyways, Steve wouldn't leave the board, even though we'd asked to speak with our grandparents and other relatives. Our relationship with Steve became more and more violent the longer that we communicated with him. He would threaten our pets and even our own lives in the end. We kind of thought it was exciting until one day he took it too far. This day, we brought a third friend to play with us. We were sitting in a circle like normal with our ankles crossed near the board. After playing for a bit and realizing that it was Steve, we decided to say goodbye. Only this time, we didn't finish the goodbye because when we looked down, all three of us had scratches on our ankles. We snatched our hands away and stood up very quickly, thus ending the conversation without saying goodbye. Big mistake. We decided then that we needed to get rid of that board, so we brought it on a little walk with us to the neighborhood pond. I held the triangle piece, my best friend held the board, and the third friend had the box. We threw each of them in different locations in the same pond and we walked away feeling like a million bucks, chanting screw Steve and everything else. It was only later that night that we realized that we had royally messed up. At 3 a.m. exactly, I woke up. The energy in my room, all I can say is that it felt really off. It was darker than usual. The shadows were blacker than usual. But then, I noticed that those shadows, they started moving. It was like an entire demonic portal opened up in my room and the energy just went haywire. The first night was definitely the worst too. I felt really alone, I was really scared, I buried my face under my covers and somehow I fell back asleep. The next day, I told my friends about it and they couldn't believe it. The exact same thing happened to them at the exact same time. We realized pretty quickly what that meant. We were now haunted by whatever this thing was. And we were, for the next three months or so, to wake up at that same site pretty much every single night. We even had a group chat going and would pretty much only communicate on it at 3am. It was terrifying to say the least and we really thought that it was never going to end. The third friend grew to resent us for a little while because she had only played with us that only horrible day and honestly, I felt sorry for her. Anyways, this story does have a bit of a happy ending, sort of. The haunting came to an end one day after a very heavy rainstorm. Somehow, and I have no idea how, that board washed back up in my friend's backyard, but... The weirdest thing is that it was completely put back together in the box with hardly any water damage. That makes absolutely no sense, I know, but my friend kept it under the stairs in the basement for many years. We never hung out in the basement alone ever again after that. Eventually, she did something kind of uh, mean, I guess, but she left it at a friend's house after a sleepover. Pretty sure the girl doesn't even know that she has it, but after that, her basement didn't seem creepy anymore and we never woke up at 3am to the site ever again, which obviously we were really relieved about. But after this whole experience, I promised myself that I would never mess with those things again. I cannot believe that they sell them in the children's aisle of all things. So, to begin, I'd just like to tell you that I've always been a believer of the possibility that certain paranormal phenomena could be real, and I do believe that I also experienced one 12 years ago. 
I was 21 years old and working in a hotel for the summer. I'm from Greece. I met there a woman, then 32 years old, that was different. She wasn't beautiful or anything, but I felt sort of magnetized by her. Not in a sexual way, but just sort of in a, a different way. Almost like charisma, I guess. We started hanging out and she told me, after I told her that I believe in the paranormal, that she has done some things in this field. I was really interested in these kinds of things at that point, so we were almost always together when we didn't work. She clearly wanted me, but I didn't want her, but anyway, one night we were four people in my room and we were drinking wine, when all of a sudden she started staring at me in a really weird way and I just couldn't take my eyes off of her. I felt sort of completely paralyzed and afraid and my heart was beating really quickly too. The next thing that I know is that her face began sort of melting. I really can't describe it better than that. And literally taking other forms which seemed ugly and sort of demonic to me. I was scared to death by that moment and completely immobilized. And after an enormous effort of will, with me sweating, I took my look from her, while the others didn't seem to realize that anything was going on. When the others left, I asked her what she was doing to me, because I was 100% sure that she had done something, and that whatever it was, it was evil. She said to me that she tried to open my chakras or something like this, and after a while she left. I didn't sleep at all that night, and after some hours I went to work, but the strange thing was that, despite my sleeplessness, I didn't feel tired at all. On the contrary, I was full of energy and felt extremely positive. When I noticed this too, I saw everywhere in the sky something like, I don't know, silver shining spots. All of this eventually went away, but after about a month I left from that job and we never saw each other again. I know it's a weird story and I have no explanation for any of it, but that's why I'm here. I'm wondering if any of you guys have any idea of what this might be. I had this experience about a year ago. I had first gotten my LED lights and at night I kept them on red to help me sleep. When out of nowhere, my room started to get colder than usual. It's pretty cold all year round here. It's in the basement too, so that doesn't help. And sometimes I felt drafts, but I kept my door closed all the time. And then I felt like something was in my room with me, watching me, but nothing ever seemed to be there. Soon I also started seeing what I thought was a tall shadow man in the corner of my room every other night or so. That was the beginning. After a week or so, I saw this huge lady on my ceiling. She was skin and bone and had long dark tangled hair and her skin was pale as it could get. Her face was very thin and her eyes were really deep sunken holes and she had no lips. She also had long thin and sharp fingers. She would be holding onto my ceiling just above me and when she arrived I, I never could move. I remember being awake while I saw her and the man in the corner as well but... They both went away after I blinked and looked away for a few seconds. It was weird. I also had a deep fear that something would grab me by my head or neck from behind my headboard, which had wide gaps between each board. But one night, I remember specifically that night I was laying in bed, just turned my phone off to go to sleep and I saw the shadow man, the lady on my ceiling, and the feeling of something behind me. I looked at the shadow man in the corner then looked up at the lady. I blinked, looked away a few times, but this time they didn't leave or go away. I felt a coldness wash over me like I had sometimes whenever I saw them and I stared up at the lady. Genuinely terrified at this point since they weren't leaving. At some point, the lady on my ceiling started moving. She has never moved during the times that I've seen her, but this time she moved. She turned her head to the side while staring down at me like always, then slowly started reaching down towards me. 
I had this strong temptation to reach back up and touch her hand, but I didn't. I figured that something bad would happen if I did. After a few seconds, I closed my eyes tightly, and after I opened them, they were gone. But my room was now so cold that I could see my breath. I haven't really seen anything like the two things in my room since then, but my room does get insanely cold sometimes, and I often feel like something's with me. The last time that I genuinely felt like the Shadow Man was with me again was in November when I was very sick. I was in a cold sweat in my room and I must have passed out at some point without turning on my LED lights. I woke up at around 3 or 4 in the morning, being colder than usual, and I saw a dark mass right in front of my face. That was the last time that I saw anything and I still feel like things are watching me or that they're near me in my room, but... It's always in my room, nowhere else in the house, which is really strange. I'm really confused by all of this, and I would really like someone to talk to about it with me. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's sleep paralysis or something else, but whatever it is, I just want it to stop. This took place last year. At the beginning of summer, I was with my mum, headed down to my nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context too, she lives on a farm way back in the country, right at the foot of a mountain in rural SC. It's a, a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road, so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. In any case, my mum and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passenger. It was around 11pm and we're about 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch out of the road into a heavily wooded area, and suddenly... This blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty fast, but both me and my mum were able to get a good look at it, and both agree on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person or bigger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a sort of segmented body, my mum's words, as if it were emaciated and its ribcage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell the color, but my mum said that she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see any fur or hair. It had long limbs and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way that a, a dog or a horse would with all four legs. The best way to describe it would be loping, using its front limbs to pull itself along and was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, what the heck was that, as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it, just as it reached the other side of the road, and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life that it stood up and ran. Not like a dog rearing on its hind legs, it was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought that I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me who saw it too. My mum has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious at all, but she, she was very nervous and made me agree not to tell my nana about it, avoiding scarring her which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock and horses in the area around this time that this happened. People were saying that they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. I don't think any died, but I remember correctly that there were a few horses that were severely wounded. There have been a few other strange instances in the area too, but that was my personal experience. So I've been in my flat for two years now. When this happened, the people living there were myself, 20-year-old female, 
My flatmate Anna, 21 year old female, and my other flatmate Joseph, 20 year old male. Initially, weird stuff happened, like the front door would open when it was locked, or the heating would turn off and on, or the light in the bathroom would turn off and on as well. But one night, it actually scared the living daylights out of me. So, I was asleep, then woke up to what I can only describe as a slender man looking figure over me, pressing down on me, and yelling at me to unlock my phone. Weird, I know. At first, I couldn't move or scream or anything, so I thought, well, that was a scary dream, and then stayed up the rest of the night just reading, because no way was I about to go back to sleep after that. This happened at around 3 in the morning, and I text my flatmate Anna, oh my goodness, the weirdest dream I have to tell you in the morning. The next morning, Anna comes to my room and was like, you won't believe this, but last night, I came out of my room at around 3.30ish, and saw this slender man thing holding your doorknob and looking like it was waiting to get into your room. At that, I gasped as I had not told her what had happened last night yet with that figure, but apparently it was the same guy. Obviously, we're questioning life at this point, so I wake up Joseph and I ask him if anything weird has ever happened to him in the flat, and he casually goes, Oh yeah, sometimes I see like a large figure crouching on top of my wardrobe. So yeah, my flat, it definitely seems to be haunted by this slender man guy. We have continued living here for another year now. Joseph moved out and another girl, Ava, 20 year old female, moved in. Sometimes the lights still flicker and the doors open, but otherwise, no slender man so far this year. So I live in an apartment in Pennsylvania. The building is over a hundred years old and it's right next to a funeral home. I've been, I've been here and never had any real strange experiences. That is, up until the last couple of weeks. I should also note that I have a child that lives with me half the time and the other half she's with her mum. And one night, while I was drifting off to sleep, I started feeling the onset of sleep paralysis. All my limbs were going stiff and starting to feel pinned down. Luckily, I was able to snap myself out of it by reaching for the closest thing to ground myself, which was my phone. I was able to sleep fine after that. But then, maybe a week later, my daughter is asleep in her room, which connects to my bedroom through a doorway that sits directly across from my bed. I woke up and I saw the silhouette of a child standing against the wall next to the door frame for my daughter's room. It was just this black mass darker than the room with no face or distinguishable limbs or hair or anything and it just seemed to stand there like it was staring at me. Her door was still closed and the figure was on the side that would be covered by the door if it were open. I was definitely freaked out by this but I chose to try and ignore it, turned my gaze away from it, and went back to sleep. When I woke up again a couple of hours later, it was gone like nothing had ever happened. But fast forward a few days and my girlfriend and I are at the flea market and run into a medium selling her wares and talking to people. I told her what I was experiencing and she looked sort of concerned and told me to cleanse my apartment by burning sage. She also gave me a small vial of holy oil to put on my front entrance to keep bad spirits away. She also wanted me to put some on my daughter's forehead to protect her. The next day, my girlfriend and I go to my apartment and we do the cleanse. And while I was cleansing a room, my girlfriend was waiting in the kitchen, which is by the front door. My girlfriend and I suddenly both hear that door slam itself shut. And crazily enough, she actually saw it happen too. But after that, my apartment has felt way more peaceful, and I even no longer get those bad vibes anymore. I do plan on moving out ASAP for different reasons, but this whole situation has me questioning everything.
Years ago, my friend and I, being Ouija non-believers, decided to give it a try one day. We just wanted to put it to the test. And I mean, why not, right? So one evening, we got together and I lit a bunch of candles to light up the room by candlelight only. Even though I was skeptical about it, I started inviting anyone who wanted to communicate over and show a sign, move the planchette, whatever. I asked questions about showing a sign, is anyone here, etc. About 20 minutes in on inviting the planchette with both of our hands on it remained motionless. But at one point, I was looking across the coffee table in which the Ouija board was on at my friend, thinking that this is just getting boring when I noted that one of the candles went out as the room got slightly darker. At the same time, I saw my friend's eyes move off to the left of me, and I thought that must be the candle just behind me which obviously went out. Anyways, another 20 minutes or so and nothing. We decided to call it quits and went through the process of closing the portal as per directions. Afterwards, we were talking and considering maybe trying it again as nothing happened or so we thought. I went to turn on the living room lamp and started blowing out the candles. Noticing the candle that I thought went out was actually still lit. Huh. Whatever. But this is where it gets weird. My friend then says, don't forget the candle behind the chair. The chair sat in the corner next to the end table where the candle I thought went out was still lit. And I said, what? I didn't put a candle behind the chair, did you? He said no, but what he saw was a light behind the chair go out. And thought that I had placed a candle behind the chair in a corner. We pulled out the chair looking for a candle, but there was none. There was nothing there, in fact. So then... What caused the light and, when it disappeared, made a distinct difference in the room going dimmer? This was enough for us to stop playing around at this point, as it spooked us, since we really couldn't explain what caused the light behind the chair to go out like that. Enough for both of us to notice, even though I was actually facing away from it. Someone or something showed a sign during the time that this portal was open. We never needed nor wanted to communicate again on that board. I think that I actually ended up giving it away not too long after or tossed it in the bin or something, but after that, never again. I have lived in this same house for a decade now. The old lady who used to live here died and her best friend still lives next door and I'm really not sure how long she has left. But this house, it's always been sort of spooky, I guess. It's always cold, it's really old, and I've had weird experiences for years as well. It's very common for me to hear footsteps, doors opening and closing, my cat staring in random corners, my front door once opened and slammed closed by itself, and my mother saw an apparition of a Victorian lady in the front hallway in the middle of the night. I was also once home alone showering downstairs and heard someone aggressively pacing back and forth in my room and opening or slamming closed my drawers as well. However, after a while I guess you just get used to it and you accept the flow of things. For a while the activity died down in fact and things seemed less scary. Plus, I moved away for university, so I got a huge break from the spooky stuff. But now that I'm back, the activity seems to have spiked a bit. You see, a few nights ago, I was having a particularly hard mental health day, up at about 4am and facing the wall trying to sleep with my back to the door. My radio is always on at low volume and the music was playing, but I suddenly hear the voice of a woman behind me almost groaning. It sounded like she was letting out all the air out of her lungs, almost wheezing. Obviously, I freaked out at that, and when I looked, there was no one. Yesterday, I was FaceTiming my boyfriend, and I hear footsteps in my house again, which I haven't heard in months. Distinct paces up the stairs, shuffling on the floorboards. I was genuinely scared, and even thought that it was an intruder, but no... 
there was no one. I am scared that perhaps I'm manifesting some serious mental health issues. I've never heard a woman before in this house and the wheezing was so clear that it was frightening. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I'm so scared of losing my sanity and I don't know, perhaps I am, but my house has always been spooky and this sudden spike has no explanation. I'm going to try and smudge the house with some herbs that I gathered to feel a little safer, so do wish me luck. I live in a pretty small rural village in Germany. Less than 200 people live here. Not much around here too besides fields, forest, cows, sheep, a donkey and maybe two horses. But directly outside of the house that I live in is a road to the right which leads into a field and then into a pretty thick forest. The route that I usually take is around maybe 18 kilometers long or 11 miles for the US listeners. I'll simply stick to miles to keep it simple too but it doesn't sound like much, but the route is very rough. It's uphill almost the entire time and the forest has no roads, so you actually walk through rough terrain with thick tree roots and bushes, etc. Anyway, I walk this exact route one to two times per week and usually when it's already dark outside. I wear a headlamp for when it's too cloudy out and the moon isn't nicely visible, so I don't trip or get hurt. Why at evening or night time, you ask? Because... I'm usually on the phone with a good friend talking and we live very far apart. It's day for her when it's night for me and I don't mind because that way I just don't feel alone hiking. Also, here's a bit of an information dump because it's pretty important. For people who are not familiar with German forests, the most dangerous thing that you may encounter is a wild boar so it's usually pretty safe to just wander around. There's almost no wolves where I'm at, and even if, they would be way too shy to just show themselves. Bears are not a thing here. Also, no crazy people living inside the forest too. The only thing that you really encounter is the farmer, who drives up like one to two miles into the road to check out on the livestock. And after that, it's all forests. No fields anymore anyway. So... Headlamp on, airpods in, talking to my friend, catching up. For the first five miles or so, nothing weird happened. I even had the headlamp off, and though I wore it on my head, the moon was making enough light, and once your eyes sort of adjusted to the dark, you could see quite well. As long as you don't sprint around the forest, you should be okay. Though, once I was in the deeper part of the forest, my airpods started making weird sounds. Almost like I was losing connection or something. But... I could hear her voice still, and it was more like a background buzzing, I guess. It wasn't actually interfering with my call or anything, but this buzzing went on and on, and after about 20 minutes or so, I suddenly noticed that I couldn't really see as well anymore as I was able to just moments ago. The moon seemed to be blocked by clouds or something, but these clouds didn't look like normal clouds. They sort of looked like thick walls of fog, just way higher than the fog should be. I know it's hard to picture, but clouds usually look fluffy or thinned out. These seemed heavy and almost wet. It's hard to describe, but I told my friend to hold on for a minute because I had to focus on something. I don't know why I said that, but focusing on her talk was disrupting my view, I guess, for whatever reason. Sensory overload, I guess. But the thing that I had to focus on was a huge, thick, deep black cloud. It kind of pushed itself through the fog like clouds and positioned itself right over me, almost as if it was trying to throw a shadow around an area that I was in. Then, the cloud also started to swirl in the middle slightly, and that was when my connection just fell flat. I got the beeping sounds that you get when you lose connection, and my phone call was now gone. No more bars and no more data. Nothing. But my AirPods were still buzzing like crazy in my ears. That was when I felt uneasy, neck hair standing up, cold sweats on my back and I started turning around to leave because the way ahead just seemed a lot more dark and sinister than my way back. And the moment that I turned around and started, well slightly jogging back because I felt scared, was when I started to hear what I can only describe as like bell sounds, almost like church bells but the sound was deeper, 
That sort of typical ring that you hear after a bell sound was just struck in the air and it was giving me this weird sensation as if my bones were suddenly rubbing up against each other. It was extremely freaky and all I remember is that I started to go from walking back to jogging back to running back, trying to leave the forest and go back to the fields where you start this journey. I didn't look back while running but I could hear the bell sound getting weaker the further away that I got and the fog-like clouds that I saw before were becoming less and less until I finally left the forest and I was back to a normal sky, thin clouds and the moon. Once I got back home, I simply undressed, went into the shower and after that, I went to bed. Thinking that I was just simply spooked or something today or maybe I was just exhausted and my brain went haywire or something, I let it go. But I don't know... I never saw a cloud like that in my life and the church bells are not a thing late at night inside an abandoned forest like this too. I never went back to hike that route again and I never told anyone because, well, it's pretty embarrassing to share something like this, right? But I had to think of it today and I thought that I would share it in the hope that maybe someone can tell me what this is. About three years ago, I was 38 weeks pregnant. My husband and I, we lived in what we called our village and it was basically two dead end streets off of a highway with forests beyond the streets, at the end of them that is, and a small local store at the corner of one street. We called it the village because our trailer park neighbours were my aunt, uncle and cousin's trailer and then my husband's brother and nieces. Then my grandma's house was on the next street over my other aunt, uncle and cousins lived with her at the time as well, and my husband and I were 21 then. So, my best friend Ray was visiting from college and had spent the night with me. The next day, we decided to walk up my street, down the highway past the store, then down by my grandma's street and back through the woods to my house. This was to try to help to get labour started as my pregnant belly was huge at that point and my back hurt often. We were talking while I sort of hobbled with her down the highway when a white truck rode by rather slowly. I knew the speed limit was 55 and this dude had to be going like 30. Through the driver's window I saw a bold white man, maybe in his 50s, sort of rubbernecking at us. At this time it looked like there might have been someone else in the passenger seat too. The truck was kind of old but I didn't know the year, make or model or see the plate or anything. Ray was talking and unbothered until I said, Hey, that guy just went by really slow and I don't think that that was anyone that I know. She replied with something like, Oh, I didn't even notice that. We were now halfway to the store as well and it was less than two minutes later when we saw him coming back from the other direction. I said, Hey, that's him again. Get in the grass. Since we were on what would have been the right side, we went down the slope of the grass off the road. We're still in front of the people's houses because the section of the highway is sort of lined with residences between the dead end streets. He passes us slowly again. When I turn to look behind us, he's slowing down even more, finds a spot and starts to turn the truck around. I told Ray to run so we ran and I was doing the best that I could being super pregnant. We thought about going into the store but decided to head for my grandma's up the other street instead. Her house was up the hill at the end but it wasn't a long run by any means. When we got up the hill I looked back again to see his truck pulling into the store parking lot. We continued to run, got to my grandma's where she and my aunt were sitting at the table and told them what just happened. My aunt made a police report. I was afraid to at first thinking that maybe I was just being paranoid. I mean, what if it was someone that I knew and they were just trying to say hi and maybe it was just a waste of the police's time. Turns out though that there had been other reports of a man creeping around the neighborhoods. Someone in another trailer park down the highway reported that her kids were outside playing when a man emerged from the woods trying to lure one of them to him. They hollered for their mom and supposedly she came out and threatened him so he ran off. But it continues... You see, a few more times we think that we see this truck, but we're not sure if it's him since one of the residents also has a white truck too. 
and my family had yet to see the truck so they couldn't identify it. But at some point when I wasn't home, a few of my cousins were playing outside. Their ages ranged from 10 to 15. And this time, the truck came rolling down our little street past them. He turned around at the end, came back up and stopped next to them. They said that he was apparently trying to lure my 11 year old cousin to the truck. But he said no and they all ran back to my aunt's house. But we had talked with the children about what was going on in the neighborhood lately so thankfully they knew what to do. One more thing happened though before the report stopped. I had my baby at 40 weeks and my husband and his friend, the baby and I were home one day. The baby was about a week old when we got a call from my aunt at my grandma's house that they had seen the man real up close and personal. My two female teen cousins were in their room. It was getting dark out but for some reason my cousin went out to open the blinds to the window and there was the man squatting on the AC unit staring at them. They screamed and he jumped off and ran into the woods behind the house. My aunt called the police. My husband and his friend later went out with guns and flashlights to search for him in the woods but they didn't find him. I believe that he was parking his truck somewhere and then stalking houses from the forest perhaps but my husband and I actually used to walk through those woods and never had any issues as it was private land that we had permission to walk on. But it also seems that this man did not have a preference for age or gender or anything. He seemed to be looking for anyone that he could get for whatever sick reason that he had in mind. But there had been police sent to patrol the highway or sit on the side of the road waiting since then, keeping an eye out for him throughout those weeks but they never did catch him. I still wonder sometimes though if he was someone from out of town and I hope maybe somewhere he gets busted before something bad happens. We might never know but I truly do hope for it. To set the scene, it was November 27th and I'm walking through the woods to avoid interacting with guests like the average antisocial teenager that I am. I have one of my uncle's dogs with me, Duke, a 150 pound Great Dane. We were passing through a clearing at the time and taking a walk. I state the size and breed of the dog to demonstrate how out of character his behavior would be too. But as we get about halfway through the clearing, he begins to walk slower and sort of begins to whine a bit. I assume that he must have hurt his paw or something so I check him over but find nothing. I turn around and in my flashlight beam, I can see a pair of eyes about maybe four feet off the ground, significantly taller than anything with eye shine in my area. I understandably freak out at this and start to back away a bit. But then, the most horrifying thing happens. Whatever it was, it stands up. Whatever was watching me is now over six feet tall easily. And then, it seemed to talk. It said help, I think, with no emotion or cadence behind it. Duke is losing his mind trying to get away and I decide that that's a pretty reasonable plan at this point. As we're running through the forest trying to get back to our house, I can hear this thing saying help, help, help over and over again, always with about five seconds apart. We eventually make it back to the house and we immediately get inside. For the next few nights, if I looked out my window... I could have sworn that I saw those same eyes gazing back at me from those woods. I don't know what it was. I've heard stories of skinwalkers, wendigos, or whatever it is, but whatever it was, I hope that I never see it again. To answer some questions as well that I'm sure you'll have, this occurred in northern Oklahoma. There was no discernible gender to the voice that I could make out. There was no discernible evidence when I went back the next day as well to have a look around. No footprints and nothing that I could spot anyway. But then again, I'm definitely no tracker or anything. So there recently was a thread on Reddit about what made you believe in ghosts and... I'll start with the same context many probably have said before, but I was an extremely skeptical individual. I believe that the majority of events that occur can be explained by logical explanations or something other than the paranormal. That was until both myself and wife had our experiences with several unexplained events. 
I want a context that these events have changed both my wife and myself's views on many things, including the paranormal. These events took place around maybe six years ago now. So my wife and I were staying in my father's house after he passed away. Everybody in the family spoke about the house being haunted as long as I can remember. Personally, I'd never had anything weird happen prior to this and overall just chalked it up to that side of the family being overzealous storytellers. But we were at the house for around a week to help clean it out as it was around six hours away from where we lived. And there were several weird events leading to the final event that changed myself and wife forever. To give better context, the house itself was a postage stamp style Victorian house with two floors and a semi-finished apartment style attic. I was going up into the attic to work on cleaning out some stuff my father had up there. He was an avid collector of NASCAR diecast and other collectibles and things were pretty much everywhere. On my way up the steps, I was on my phone with my wife who had went to get some food when I saw the handle on the attic door twist and the door slightly open. This area where we're in is not necessarily dangerous but was far from nice and I instantly thought that somebody had broken in and immediately ran up to investigate. I searched everywhere and I couldn't find anyone. In retrospect, I know it was idiotic to go up there alone as if someone was up there. I was not prepared to handle it or anything. But grief makes emotions just dull, I guess, including fear. The second event was that my wife, myself and my childhood friend were in the same attic cleaning out items. In the attic, there was this thick old shag carpet that had been there from like the 70s. Since it was a semi-finished attic, one room was for storage and is where my buddy was working. I look at my wife at some point who literally just points at the door. And we both watched the door for that room close slowly on my buddy. But there was zero reasoning or explanation for how this happened. As we both saw it and the door itself took a, a large amount of force to actually close it. Obviously, my buddy was pretty unhappy and we both just sort of said sorry, forgot you were in there to avoid him thinking both of us were losing our minds or scare him or something. Now, the last night that we stayed there, we slept on the second floor in the master bedroom. The bedroom itself was positioned so that the headrest of the bed's wall was sort of aligned with a set of chairs coming up. The wall and the stairs were about maybe 3 to 15 feet difference in height, depending on the location. And that's an important piece to what ended up happening too. So throughout the night, my wife kept waking me up to say that someone was walking around on the platform leaning outside. I looked and did see what looked like a shadow under the door frame, so I immediately opened the door and braced for what I assumed was an intruder. But again, there was nothing there, even after searching the house extensively. Later that night, I'm awoken to sounds of scratching in the wall behind my head, my wife is already awake and looking at me oddly and sort of terrified as she hears it too. I assume that it's a rat or some type of animal, and while weird that it was directly behind me, it wouldn't be far-fetched to possibly believe that it was just some critters in the house because the house certainly had them. So in a sort of tired rage, I turn around and just punch the wall to scare it off. But within a second, something punches back on the wall with such force that it shakes the entire thing. We both then hear footsteps stomping or running away from us and up the attic stairs. At this moment, we're both at a loss for words and we immediately pack up with our son and we just leave. We even called the police and just assumed that it has to be someone who broke in until the next day when we started to think about it. You see, the area where the scratching was occurring was above those steps, a good 10 feet and even an extremely tall man would have trouble reaching with a ladder. However, even if they could reach, what we couldn't explain is how this thing ran on a floor that literally didn't exist. The sound of running was not up steps, but as if there was a, a hallway or a, a floor or something directly behind the wall, which obviously there wasn't. The police, they found no signs of a break-in or of any intruder being there. The security cameras, the ring outside, never had any alerts or saw anyone coming in either. And so, in the end, we just ended up selling the house as is with everything in it and never stayed over there again. I did come down briefly a few weeks later to finish up some final business and just went to tell my father goodbye at the house. And upon entering, the, 
house just, I don't know, it felt so hateful is the only way that I can describe it. I don't understand how a house could have feelings, but if someone was to ask me what I felt, hateful is the word that I would use. I have no idea to this date what any of it was anyway, but to clarify, had I not been in such a state of grief, I would never have investigated nor stayed after the first event. My dad always brushed off the other family members' claims to it being haunted as no big deal and even in my childhood years visiting, I never once had an odd experience. My dad and I had a good relationship throughout his life and he never talked about the house in a negative light. The house was built in 1879 by a French family and after them, my family owned it from 1952 and on. Nothing traumatic ever happened there, nor any weird family events. It was just a, a plain old boring house prior to that week. But I'm wondering, how has everyone else coped with a truly unexplainable event like this? My wife and I still to this day cannot even talk about it without getting chills or just literally feeling insane. So my girlfriend's mother is a, a long-time heroin user and has been in and out of jail for my girlfriend's whole life pretty much. When she lived with her mother and her mother's husband, she witnessed physical abuse and drug activity. She was forced to move out at a very young age in order to stay alive and she thought that her mother was finally clean when her mother announced her pregnancy. After getting over the initial shock, my girlfriend decided to be supportive of her mother since she thought that she was clean. That was until her mother overdosed while pregnant. She decided to cut all contact at that point. My girlfriend is also a mandated reporter and last year reported her mother and her mother's husband to the state since she knew that it wasn't a safe situation for the baby. Unfortunately, the baby died and I won't go into details about how it all happened, but it was horrible to say the least. My girlfriend's mother was arrested and her husband was arrested for child endangerment and other charges very recently. And at first, the judge did not grant either of them bail. Eventually, her husband was granted bail in which he posted. We didn't know this until recently, which helped us to put some of the pieces together. My girlfriend and I like to sit outside her house in the car and just sort of chat or listen to music sometimes. And recently, there have been black cars around my girlfriend's house. She also is frequently followed by black cars when she drives me home. It's the same couple of black cars that do this too. They're not just random ones. And at first, we thought that we were just being paranoid since everyone was still in jail, right? But when we found out that the husband was out of jail, we began to doubt our insanity. The first major thing happened after my girlfriend and I went on a dinner date. We got home after dark and sat in a car for about 45 minutes before we noticed the same black car passing by us every few minutes. After 10 minutes of that, a different car drove towards us, flicking its high beams on when it got close enough for us to see who was inside. It swerved into the oncoming lane and I genuinely thought that it was going to hit the passenger side of the car. It sped away and after that we ran inside. And after this, we started noticing the black cars more and more. For instance, this past Wednesday morning around 3am ish, the same distinct black van that we had seen being pulled up outside of my house was there. This was weird too because my girlfriend and I live about 30 minutes from each other in two separate cities. The man got out of the van and shined a flashlight through my yard, scanning it almost. He shined the flashlight up at the window that I was sitting at kept it there for a second, then walked 30 feet to an empty driveway, scanned around there for 20 seconds before getting in the van and peeling away. The windows were ice covered and frozen so I couldn't make out the specifics of the van but it was definitely strange. A few nights later my girlfriend and I spent some time hanging out in the car when we spotted a black van hiding behind another parked car further up the street. We could only see one headlight but it creeped by us as we sat in the car and my girlfriend lives between two dead end streets. I think of a, a very blocky U I guess but she lives between the two prongs and the van went up the first dead end four ways on and sat for a few minutes before turning around and driving almost in the other lane of traffic to get close to us. It then went up the other dead end and stayed put. 
We thought that it was weird that the van didn't just back out of the first dead end, instead opting to drive all the way up the narrow street and turn around like that. After a few minutes, we call a friend and recount the story just to get an extra opinion. While my girlfriend was talking to our friend, I got out of the car to go for a cigarette and to see how far away the van was. I walked up the dead end that the van was on for about 15 feet before getting the worst gut feeling that I had ever gotten. Across the street from me was a, a black mass which was darker than the darkness around it. And at that, I decided to just turn around and rush my girlfriend into the house. Later that night, we heard a bang coming from downstairs, followed by what sounded like a boot on wooden stairs. We locked the bedroom door and I sat against the door with a baseball bat, hopeful to barricade it. A few minutes later, we heard a car door slam before the sound of tires squealing and a car driving out of it. Our initial idea was maybe it came from the TV, but we had paused it and the TV in the next room is never loud enough to feel real, I guess. When I went downstairs an hour later to get some water, there was nothing damaged or missing, though. We theorized that maybe it was the sound of the front door trying to be opened, even though it was deadbolted. My girlfriend's exterior wall doesn't face the road and we've never heard car sounds before, it is, however, next to the private driveway, and sometimes we will hear her grandparents' car door close or the neighbors backing out or whatever. But the next day, I was shoveling the sidewalks at my girlfriend's house, an activity that took about 20 minutes, and I saw that same black Chevy Silverado with mud streaks on the tailgate. It circled the block about four times, and I was able to see the silhouette of a man driving through the passenger side window. And each time, it's always been the same man and the same truck. My girlfriend lives in a small town too, and we've been able to catalogue the neighbourhood cars pretty well. The black van and the truck are definitely abnormal. Our theory is that someone is trying to scare my girlfriend into not testifying, or flat out making sure that neither of us ever have the ability to testify. But we really just need opinions at this stage. Are we just paranoid, or... Do you think that this is something that we should actually be worried about? Do you think that these are just weird coincidences or is there something more going on? I think about this a lot and I truly think that I might have stopped a, a kidnapping just by being in a parked car. So my ex-boyfriend, he lived with me for over a year and there was a period of time where his truck was acting up, so I would pick him up from work and stuff like that. He worked just down the road from my place at a liquor store, so he'd get out at around 10pm on weeknights. One night he asks me to pick him up and I agree. I get all swaddled in my pyjamas and drive down to grumpily wait for him since my bedtime was around 10pm due to my job and all that. I parked my car in the small parking lot out front. His liquor store is sort of sandwiched between an adult shop and a head shop. Party central, I guess, but... By now, the head shop and the liquor store are closed, so their thirds of a, a lot are mostly empty. The adult shop only had one other car in front of it, and... Outside the liquor store is my car and one other, three total cars. With a woman standing outside of it, sitting on her hood. I didn't think much of it... I mean, maybe she was waiting for someone in the adult shop or one of my ex-co-workers just relaxing in the summer night air or something. I sit hunched in my seat, car off, playing on my phone, when I notice a white van. I know, cliche, but I think that's why I noticed it. Pull into the lot. It drives sort of slowly, then back out onto the main road. Weird, but maybe they wanted alcohol and saw the store... Weird, but maybe they wanted alcohol and saw that the store was closed. Whatever, I go back to my phone, but... I glance at the woman, still outside of her car, but move between my car and hers. I had parked a couple of spots over, so close but not too close. I go back to my phone. When the same white van pulls in again and stops in front of her, I sit up slightly to watch. I'm a true crime nut, what can I say? I'm easily alerted and watch some guy roll down the van window and sort of lean out to talk to the woman. I pull out my phone to snap a photo of the license plate, again just in case, but 
I can't really see it, so I turn on my car and go to open the door, but the guy in the van instantly pulls away and leaves, like in a hurry. The woman moves closer to my car as I get out and approach her, ask her what was that, and she says that she doesn't know. He was trying to ask her for directions, but stopped mid-sentence when I turned my car on. I asked her if she's waiting for anyone, and she says kind of. She's been sitting outside the liquor store for three hours waiting on a tow truck because she locked her keys inside of her car, and she couldn't leave the car because her puppy was in the back seat. Thankfully, not a hot night. It was a, a very nice night, in fact, so she was waiting for a tow truck. As her and I are talking, my ex comes out and asks what's up, and so we decide to help her since there was no way that I was leaving her alone now. I have some rope in my car for emergencies, and my ex uses it to basically jimmy her door open, make a lasso and sort of hook it around her door lock and pull it open. It works, and we open the door just as the tow truck pulls in. Her puppy is safe, of course, and we wish her well, and I get back in the car and just tell my ex, you know, I genuinely think that I almost just watched her get kidnapped. So, I need to provide a bit of backstory for this. When I was 11 or 12, I can't quite remember which age, but I moved away from my dad's house to live with my mum and stepdad. I'll spare you the details, but it was basically to escape a, a less than desirable situation. Anyway, my mum and her boyfriend at the time, who we'll call Elias, the name of a bad guy from one of my favourite shows, my stepdad looks exactly like him too, rented a house in a pretty sketchy neighbourhood. It's all that they could afford at the time, and so, as a result, I went to a pretty rundown school. The teachers and the staff were nice enough, but I've definitely been in more than one scary situation because of this school's location. But I digress. While at this school, I made an assortment of friends, but there was one girl in particular who became my best friend. Her name was Brittany. My new friend was pretty problematic, I guess you could say. She'd talk to a lot of older boys, put herself in less than ideal scenarios, that kind of thing. Turns out she was acting out during her home life too. Much like me, she was being raised by her stepdad and mother. The only difference is, well, there's a lot, but details and her mum was basically not too keen on her daughter chatting with her biological father, if you catch my drift. Brittany's mum never really disclosed why, but whenever he did come over to talk with Brittany, it was always done under supervision. I only met the guy once. Brittany had invited me over to her house for a sleepover on one occasion, my first time there too, and her dad dropped by unexpectedly. I can't really remember much about what he said to Brittany or how her mum reacted. I'd assumed that it wasn't good, but there is one thing that I can still remember till this day. The minute that he walked in, there was a complete shift in the air. And I'm not talking about tension, but like, the hairs on the back of my neck instantly stood up. Like, I was prey and there was a wolf nearby. Needless to say, I kept my interactions with Mr. Creepy short and simple, and I kept my distance from him too. That was the only time that I ever met the guy, and I'm very thankful for it too, because... Well, fast forward a couple of years, I graduated from that middle school and started high school. I kept in touch with one of my friends, who their name was Rain, but I lost contact with Brittany. I can't exactly remember why, I guess we sort of just stopped talking as much and sort of drifted apart, but Rain and I had met up at a local mall and were at the food court reminiscing about our middle school days. And that's when Rain perked up and asked me if I'd heard about what happened with Brittany. I obviously said no, that me and her sort of lost contact. Rain grinned that familiar way. She was about to give me some juicy gossip and I knew it. I thought she was going to tell me that Brittany got pregnant or something, but boy oh boy, that couldn't have been further from the truth. Brittany's father is an offender, which I didn't know, but back in 2009, he had picked up a street worker and drove her to a motel. I won't go into detail about what had happened, but... A young woman lost her life because of this guy. He managed to get away with it for three years as well before the police were able to find him. And the way that they accomplished it? Well, the police released video surveillance of his truck 
and released it to the public. Someone was able to identify who the truck belonged to, and the cops were finally able to work their way from there. And from what I hear, he was charged with first-degree murder and will only spend seven years in prison, since he spent a few years in jail while the trial took place. It was a, an extremely sad thing to find out. Brittany and I might have drifted apart, but I can't imagine what she went through and is still going through after what her dad did. I hope that wherever she is, she's doing okay and... I hope that the family who lost their loved one is able to find some peace someday too. What a horrible thing to happen. When I was 18, I went on my first trip alone to Seattle from Montana. I was alone with my dog and it was a pretty normal trip overall, except we were driving late at night. I was listening to the BBC talk show on AM and they were talking about some subject I don't really remember but it was spooky and the radio was super static. We were in the area of I-90 that doesn't have much signal and is pretty much just 100% empty and quiet before the pass. I suddenly got really tired and my radio wasn't working so I decided to pull off to sleep. I decided to pull off on a deserted exit with no services. I believe it was called Six Mile Road or something like that, but anyways, it was extremely dark out there. I couldn't see anything to my sides or in front of me. There was fog on the road as well, swirling around just in front of my headlights. And there was absolutely nothing around me for like a mile and the road didn't veer off anywhere either. So after a bit of driving, I pulled up to this huge sort of white grey warehouse with no windows. There were several white vans and black cars parked around it. They looked very expensive for being in the middle of nowhere, but the warehouse was locked by a huge barbed wire fence. I backed up my car a bit and I decided to park by the tree since it didn't appear that anybody was around. Everything was still dark and silent. There was no wind except for a slight breeze carrying the fog around the cement. I turned my car off completely and wrapped myself up in my blanket. I locked all the doors and I was laying there trying to sleep and looking at the time on my phone. It was 2am, and at that same moment, my car started to physically shake. My dog started whining and hid behind the passenger chair, obviously distressed. I looked outside of my window, but everything was pitch black without my headlights. I couldn't see anything, but my car was shaking back and forth and side to side even, like something was grabbing it and pushing it around. I turned it on, freaking out and backed up, but there was still nothing around me at all except for the strange facility. There were no animals, no people, not that I could see anyway. My car stopped shaking as soon as I backed up though and I had this horrible feeling of dread and that I was being watched and that I wasn't supposed to be there. So in the end I left the area as fast as I could. But the strangest thing is that when I got back on the road I noticed that my car's time was now 4.30am and I had a quarter of a, a tank less gas. It was already getting light out and I don't remember going anywhere and my phone's time matched the car so I really don't know what the heck happened. There's only one hour of time difference between Montana and WA so it wasn't that. And I still to this day just don't know what the heck happened there. I tried looking up the area with my ex on Google Maps a year ago and... I found a weird government facility near this place with a weird name that may have been the warehouse that I went to. I'll try to find it again and it definitely feels like something that, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have seen it. So this is a very strange story and I really don't know what to think about it but... I'm a member of a website that posts pictures of gravestones for people. One day a picture was requested of a very old gravestone in a graveyard walking distance from my house so I agreed to take it. I walked to there, found the grave and stood over the almost 200 year old grave to see if it was the grave that I was looking for considering how degraded the stone was. And as I was standing there my foot suddenly began to sink into the grave. In fact I couldn't get out and soon it was up to my hip. I nearly passed out. I was sure that something was going to grab my foot. I think I was in shock but 
It took me several minutes to get free and I very nearly lost my shoe. I was sobbing when I was done as I was running away, but that night too I had an extremely vivid dream that I still remember. I was talking to what I thought was a Civil War soldier on a battlefield. He was telling me all about his life and apologizing for scaring me and he told me to call him Charlie. Anyway, the next day I went to church to let them know about the collapsed grave, you know, for safety reasons and all that. They looked it up on their map to make sure it was the one that I was talking about. And I was absolutely jaw-dropped to find out that the grave belonged to a soldier who was killed in the Civil War and his first name was Charles. So this has quite a bit of backstory. Strap in. This all started back in 2011 when I was 12 and had moved into a new home with my family. From the get-go, that place made me feel some type of way. It wasn't good or bad, just like I was always being watched, which of course creeped me out a bit. There were a handful of hotspots too throughout the house where I would feel this. One being what we called the pink bathroom, which was, as you can guess, all pink. Pink tiling, pink sink, pink flooring even, everything. It was also a bit small and I always felt like it was a bit hard to breathe in there and overall I just hated the energy. I figured maybe I was just claustrophobic or something. Another was this part of the hall that led directly into my bedroom and branched off directly into the living room as well. Kind of like a T in a road. But anyways, you almost always felt eyes on you coming from that corner, whether you were in the living room or my room, and it felt just as creepy regardless if it was morning or night. The final spot was, of course, the basement. The basement was half finished. The finished half was like a, a bar area, I guess, but had the stools and everything still there, and the unfinished half was the laundry or storage or sort of workshop thing. Actually, when we first moved in there, my dad and sister and I were looking through the workshop. There were a bunch of old yearbooks from the school that I went to and other memorabilia. We took a break and headed upstairs for lunch and came back to find that the door would no longer open. It seemed like the door handle had fell off while we were away or something and the door was sort of stuck in place. Not super sure how that could have happened, especially considering that it locked from the inside and none of us locked it. But on top of that, my mum had my sister and I wash our dog down in the basement. We had a laundry area and a big tub sink, but we hated doing it. I always felt like when I was down there that someone was just watching me. I even had an idea of what he looked like. I imagined a, a very tall man in a button-up and slacks standing in the corner, right by the entrance to the back of the bar area that resided mainly on the furnished side. My hair would stand on end every time and always I would sprint up those stairs whenever I was done down there and the rest of the house felt off too but those were the big spots that just sort of radiated energy. Anyway, so fast forward a few years and we moved around in 2014 and by that point I had had a handful of bad dreams about that house. I had dreams of it when I lived there which made sense but... Even after leaving, they seemed to persist. In fact, they actually persisted up to 2020, and by that point I was 21 years old. I'd been having dreams of that place for nearly a decade, and by this point, the dream sort of escalated to night terrors too. I would wake up screaming in the middle of the night. The dreams always occurred every three to six months, but by April of 2020, I had had three intense night terrors about the house within three months. The last dream being my sister telling me that someone had died in the pink bathroom. I started realizing that maybe something else was going on. I started researching the house after this and found that the first owners, the ones who had built that house back in I believe was the 1950s, that this seemed like a good place to start anyway. I quickly discovered that it was a family that lived there and that the father had died in the house in the 1980s. Upon further investigation, I learned that he had died of a massive heart attack in the house. This house was located directly across the street from a hospital, like the driveway and the hospital lot entrance sort of lined up a bit. Definitely clued me in on this being a traumatic death, so 
I continued, and I found his wife's obituary too. She had stayed in the house after he had passed, and since she had passed more recently, the information regarding their children was more up to date. I immediately felt drawn to one particular child, their one daughter. I actually ended up finding her on Facebook and reaching out too, and of course I realized what I was about to do could be potentially harmful or hurtful, so I prepared my message accordingly, trying my best not to do that, but I even mentioned the hotspots we covered earlier. I didn't mention what sensations or events happened in those areas though since I wanted to see what she had to say. But my heart stopped when I read that he had died in that pink bathroom. And I remembered where I dreamed my sister told me somebody had died in that pink bathroom and now all I could wonder was, could that have been a weird coincidence? She continued to say that she loved his workshop and that he never let anyone in it. And on top of that, always spent time downstairs by that corner entrance in his bar since that's where he kept his favorite drinks. My bedroom belonged to his wife, who no longer loved him the way that he loved her, which would make sense as to why I felt eyes from the doorway, but it never would that presence enter my room, I guess. She also shared that she was the child closest with her father, and they shared the room my sister stayed in. I asked my sister about this later on, and... She stated that she definitely felt uncomfortable in the house, but never any specifics. I told the daughter the man that I saw in my imagination, the very tall, well-dressed man, and she said that her dad was 6'3", and a businessman, always in a button-down and slacks. She even sent a picture of him, and man, I was completely startled by how closely this guy looked like the man in my head. After this, I've never had another dream involving that house ever again, though. It's been almost three years free of those awful dreams. And sometimes I wonder, could he have used me to tell his daughter that he was so close with that he was still around? That there was more to the other side and that the only way to get my attention was through my dreams? It also seems so self-absorbed to think that he could choose me to do such a thing, but... I'm just not sure of any other explanation as to what happened here. All my life I've had weird paranormal or I guess you could say borderline psychic occurrences, but this, this one is definitely the most interesting to date. So I don't remember exactly how old I was at that time, but I was still in kindergarten. When my dad picked me up, we often used to stop by in the park on the way home, and for a little context, my dad was and is a great man, and when I was little, around that same time, he used to make maps for treasures for me to find, and he would actually hide some real treasures around the park so that I could find them. So, we were in the park as usual, and while we were walking there, there was this sort of sewer hole from which were coming waves of steam as if it was a furnace or something. We were heading towards it to check it out, and I remember my dad saying, Look, maybe here is where Santa prepares the gifts for the good children. I laughed a little bit at that, because around that time I already knew that Santa wasn't real. Then, as we passed by the hole, I looked through the holes of the covering, and what I saw was a man wearing a weird triangle-shaped head. Everything happened very fast, and... I could only barely see through the holes and all the steam, but the man was sitting on a table and it looked as if he was writing something. When I saw him, I remember freezing for a little moment and there were many things going on through my little head at that time and I thought either that was a real elf and my dad was telling the truth or maybe it was a man hired by him for me to see, just like he hid all the treasures. Anyway, I didn't really tell him anything and he didn't say anything either. When we arrived home, I remember telling my grandma that I saw a Christmas elf in the park and she laughed and said, that's great, or something to that effect. I knew she didn't believe me, obviously, and my dad was also laughing. The following days, though, I kept thinking about it, but with time I just went on with the idea that my dad told some man to dress up as an elf and jump in the sewer for me to see to make me believe in magic of Christmas or something. Well, a few years later I finally asked him about it and he said that he never did this and 
He asked me more about what I saw. I told him and he said that it was probably just my wild imagination and being little. However, I know exactly what I saw and I remember clearly to this day what it was. I even went to the exact same park since then to inspect that area but a lot has changed since then and that place looks totally different now. No walking path, no sewer hole, just plain grass there now. But what's even weirder is that as the years went by, whenever I remember that man, I start comparing him more and more with myself. I only saw him briefly and from behind, but I could see his hair and the color and the type that was just as mine, and also his back looked like mine in some pics that I took after I grew up as well. This might just be me overthinking it throughout time, I admit, but anyway, I know it's a weird story, and whether you believe it or not, it's up to you, but... It is one of the strangest things that has ever happened to me. I'm not sure what year this took place, but my little sister was of preschool age. I'm two and a half years older than her, and we're now in our twenties. So my family was in San Diego visiting my grandparents. They live inland in a quiet neighborhood. We were racing our scooters down the sidewalk in front of the house one by one. My little sister, my big sister and I, all girls, our parents were inside. A van came down the road at some point and we initially thought nothing of it, but the van kept coming back. Every couple of minutes it would pass again and after a short amount of time we noticed it. We continued to scooter, the van would take its time passing, slowing down. It was clear that whoever was driving was paying close attention to us and I was on guard by this point. My baby sister takes her turn, scootering down the sidewalk. The van passes again and comes to a crawl directly beside her. It stops next to my little sister as she's slowing down. My big sister and I are screaming for her to come back, paralyzed with fear. I genuinely thought I was about to watch her be snatched up, but luckily she turned around and scooted past the doors of the van a second or two after it stopped. I ran up to meet her, the driver left quickly, presumably to circle back around, and they did. My older sister had gone inside to alert my mother, who promptly came out. Well, we sat on the steps in front of my grandparents' house waiting. The van came around the corner, and once they saw my mum, they sped off down the road so fast. We didn't get the license plate number, which we immediately regretted, but I'll never forget that experience and the sheer terror I felt as... I watched my baby sister standing next to that van, just waiting for that sliding door to open up and for her to be snatched inside. The memory of these events is still clear years later. It really frightened me at the time, but looking back, I don't know if it was evil at all. It just wanted to play it seemed and seemed perhaps lonely. I think it could have been perhaps the spirit of a child itself or something. Anyway, when I was eight my bedroom and bed were arranged such that if I lay on my left hand side I could see the landing and the stairs. My bedroom was adjacent to the bathroom and toilet so I could see when people went up and down the stairs and to the bathroom as well. I had a four-year-old sister too, and a newborn brother. My sister had her own bedroom, and the baby slept in my parents' bedroom. My sister would go to bed at least an hour before me, and the landing light would be left on until my parents went to bed. And one night, I was lying on my right-hand side, trying to go to sleep, when I felt a poke in my back. I spun around, and what I saw was a small dark shadow run out of the room across the landing and down the stairs. I presumed that it was my little sister, so I went downstairs and complained to my mum and dad that she had poked me and how come she was still up. My mum took me back upstairs and showed me that my little sister was still asleep in bed. I thought that she must have snook back into her bed, but when I checked, she was deeply asleep. The following nights, I tried to always lay on my left so that I could see who was poking me. Nothing happened, so I went back to normal. And a few nights later, the poking happened again. I jumped out of bed, ran into my sister's room and shouted at her to stop poking me. 
This woke her up and she started screaming and crying, obviously. I was told off by my mum and sent back to bed. But as I lay there watching the door, I saw this small dark shadow slowly slip through the door, cross the landing and head down the stairs again. Every now and then when I would lay on my right, the poking would happen again and I'd see the shadow running away. I tried telling my parents, but they thought that I must have been dreaming, but I knew that I wasn't. This continued sporadically as well until my brother needed his own bedroom and I moved to a new bedroom in the loft space. My sister, she moved into my old bedroom and he moved into her old bedroom. Bizarrely, years later at her wedding reception, she told the story of me tormenting her by poking her in the back some nights when she was trying to go to sleep in my old bedroom, but obviously I never did this. I have to wonder, was it the same small dark shadow that I experienced? The house that I live in was built sometime in the 40s and it sits on five acres of land. I live in a very small town, smaller than small actually, I call it a micro town. I mean, it's hardly even a town, there's just not much here, and it's pretty rural but nestled between two other cities. Only about a quarter of our land is cleared, the rest is dense woods, but we don't really go back in there often because of ticks. However, my boyfriend has been throughout the whole property at some point and he came across what used to be another house deep in the woods. It looks as though it burned down apparently and all that's left is some bricks which actually match the bricks of our fireplace and front porch and the cement blocks the house once sat on too which match the cement blocks of our house. But our house is all wood except for vinyl siding which was probably put on in the last 30 years or so I'm guessing. I'm assuming the old house burned down and the original family rebuilt the current one that we live in. All five acres have remained as one property over the years so the original family owned every bit that we own now and there's just really no record to my knowledge of the house that we found in the woods so there's no telling how old it actually is. The town, it was established in the 1830s. Something odd to note too is that there are no cemeteries here which I do know that it was common to have a family plot on your own property and most homes were sit on at least a, a few acres so honestly I believe that there could be a couple of people buried here somewhere but we haven't found any headstones or anything. But also if they were marked with flat headstones and they could possibly be grown over or covered and we just haven't found them. So here's where the paranormal aspect comes into play though. A few months ago I was getting ready for work, I was in the bathroom with the door open, the bathroom is at the very back of the house when I suddenly heard a woman talking. As I stepped out into the hall, it suddenly stopped. I sort of walked around and I made sure the TV wasn't on or the computer or something and that it wasn't my phone which was right next to me. In the end I just couldn't find anything so I brushed it off and I carried on. I did tell my boyfriend's dad about it though and so he mentioned seeing a shadow figure in the living room or dining room area once which is where the woman's voice I think was coming from. A few days ago though while I was at work my boyfriend was here alone in the office at the back of the house by the bathroom. He was messing with a knife or something and all of a sudden he hears a woman's laughing and it, so it sounded like it came from the front of the house he said. He's a complete skeptic and has never had a paranormal experience before, but he texted me right away and I reminded him of when I heard her talking too. And this brings me to two nights ago. So we were sitting on our bed with the door open right across from the kitchen. We had the lights off aside from the lamp in our room and he looked at me and said that he apparently just saw a figure walk across the kitchen toward the dining room. I've personally never seen a figure myself or anything uh, physical I guess you could say but we aren't really scared I guess. Whatever is here seems to be friendly so far. I just wish that I knew more about the history of this property and if I could figure that out then maybe I could figure who this ghost is that seems to be with us.
This occurred in the winter of 2017. I'm a male in my 20s living alone in a studio apartment in a bad neighborhood at the time and it was a normal weekday night. I spent it indoors playing games on my PS4 and smoking a bit early into the morning. My lights were off and only the glare of the TV lit up the room slightly. And all of a sudden at around 2 in the morning I hear a knock at my door. I ignored it at first thinking that it was the game but then I heard it again and I quickly paused the game and went over to the door quietly. I looked out the peephole and said, who is it? Then the stranger responded by saying that it's the mailman. I go over to my window next to the door to get a better look at this person. There are obviously are no mailmen that deliver at 2am so I open the shutters slightly and I saw a, a Caucasian man that looks like maybe he was on drugs or something. He was also hiding a large black trash bag that looked like it was full. I yelled at him in anger through the window, you're not the mailman, get away from here. He sort of stood there for a moment, not even noticed that I'm looking right at him. Then he sort of continues to wobble away slowly, dragging his heavy trash bag of who knows what away with him. I didn't report the incident and I never saw the creep again, but... I heard some creepy stories from others around the neighborhood that seemed to align with my experience and I don't know, something about that guy just told me that he was up to no good. So to begin this, I had just enrolled at my university as a mature student. I was 22 so a little bit older than the norm which is around 18 to 19. And because of this, I was allowed to enter my dorms a week before the rest of the students would arrive. So, I was basically the only person staying in the entire apartment block for the week. Seven floors and probably over a hundred rooms. And I lived on the seventh floor. So, day one, I was part of a, a head start program for the mature students getting back into education. On my first day, I went to the icebreakers and got to meet my fellow mature students. Quite a good time too, I must admit. The evening comes and I'm leaving everyone and heading back to the block. None of the friends that I had met earlier in the day lived in my block so it was kind of sad but anyway I, I get back, put a pizza in the oven and just hop into bed and start watching a random stuff on my laptop. About 10 minutes later I hear the door to my flat open and close and I think yes I've got a flatmate now. That's what I thought at least. So I rushed up out of bed and went to open my door to greet them. And as I look out from my room into the hallway, there's nothing. No one, in fact. I look either side of the hallway before leaving the room and it's completely empty. Me being the extrovert that I am, though, I assume that maybe they've already gone into their room somehow, so I proceed to knock on all the doors of my flat one by one. There were ten plus rooms and a kitchen as well. And after knocking on all the doors and getting no answer, I just sort of dismiss it as me hearing things or maybe a weird noise from the oven or something. And in the end, I just eat my pizza and I fall asleep to the TV. So the second day, I wake up full of energy and excited for the new day. I have a mini football that I brought with me and since I'm the only person in the flat, I figured that I'm just going to go kick this ball around and make a ton of noise. That I should probably do that before all my flatmates move in and complain. After all, I have the whole flat to myself for the whole week. So, I immerse myself into smacking this football around the entire flat. Off the walls, ceilings, against the oven, fridge, anything really. Plus, it was small, so it wouldn't cause any damage or anything. But after I'm done with that, I go to my introduction sessions and I make a few friends there. One of them is called George. We're all sort of getting along and having a good time and then the evening comes and I have to head back. At this time, I just head into my room, drop my bag down, and I head into the kitchen. I make dinner and chill for a bit. Then I head back into my room and watch some more TV. It's starting to get late, like 3 or 4 a.m. I'm definitely a night owl, and this is when I start to hear groaning in the hallway outside of my room. It sounds a bit like somebody who has had too much to drink and is sort of stumbling to their room, so I open the door, but again... There's nothing and no one there. Huh. That's weird, I thought. I'm sure I heard someone. 
I cautiously make my way back into bed and maybe five minutes pass when I distinctly hear the sounds of like nails scratching on the outside of my door. So I think to myself, okay, I definitely have a flatmate out there somewhere. They're probably drunk and I'm going to go and help them out. So I rush out the door this time, but same thing. Nobody is there. And this time I got out there so quickly that there's just no way that someone could have disappeared. I even go around and knock on all of the doors again, but there's no answer. This happens a few times that night as well, and I eventually just get really tired and I fall asleep. Day three comes around and not much happened on the third day, but something that I did notice is that it was strange how my football that I was kicking around the flat would always end up under my bed in the far corner, no matter where I left it the night before. I'd only been there for two nights at this point, so I just thought maybe the floor was uneven or something. I later found out that it wasn't though. Day four and... Same usual routine of going to my sessions and then heading back. This time I'm up late again and I get a bit hungry so I open my door which is right next to the kitchen and as I'm about to enter and turn the light on I hear, hey, clear as day. It was such a vivid sound that I even pictured George's face in my head as I turned around because it sounded like him. I thought that a new flatmate had come to greet me or something. However, when I do turn, again, there's nobody there. The hallway is completely empty, but I specifically heard someone call out to me. That one was very strange, and I got goosebumps from that. I end up going to the fridge, grabbing a snack, and then I sort of hustled my way back to bed, and I fell asleep. Day five, after all of the strange goings-on in the past four days, I reckon to myself that I do have a flatmate, and I just haven't met them yet. So when I get up, I knock on all the doors again, but there's definitely no answer. I go about my day, same as before. I stayed out late this night as there was a little party or sort of social gathering on campus. And as I'm coming home now, I open the door to my block with my keycard and walk over to the elevator. I normally press seventh floor and when it arrives, there's this little pleasant sort of jingle female voice that says seventh floor or whatever. And... So, as usual, I press 7. The elevator has mirrors on every wall, so I'm just sort of staring at my reflection blankly while it goes up. Then, as it gets to my floor, instead of the female voice coming out of the lift, it was a male voice. What it said, I don't really recall, but I do remember as I'm looking at my reflection, my eyes bulged open like, what the heck was that? I look at the number and it's my floor. Thinking that my mind is playing tricks on me and maybe it had been a male voice, not a female's, the whole time, I press 6 to go down a floor. When I arrive, just like always though, the female voice comes out of the speaker, announcing 6th floor in the same pleasant tone. Maybe uh, it's a male voice for the 7th and I just haven't noticed? I go back up to my floor and this time it's back to the female voice. Weird, I thought. I head back and I unwind a bit until I fall asleep. Day 6, probably the least eventful day, not much out of the ordinary happened, other than the football always ending up under my bed. So it was kind of a nice change to be honest, but instead I spent the time going floor to floor and just looking at the empty block to see if anyone at all had moved in, but from what I could see, no. Day 7 arrives and... Finally, I wake up to the sound of people chatting outside the entrance to my block. I jump out of bed and look out the window. It, over, it overlooked the entrance. And finally, some flatmates, I thought. I get dressed and head straight down to greet them. There's a group of them that have just arrived and have started moving into the block. When I go over and speak to them, they're talking about ghosts and paranormal things. Then I ask them, why did you bring up that topic? And one of them tells me, our campus is haunted. This is apparently the most haunted campus in the UK and that someone had apparently ended their lives in the block that I had just been staying alone in for a week, allegedly a few years prior. He had lived on the sixth floor and had been having a hard time and ended up jumping from his room window or something and 
I was a bit startled and thought that they were lying, but then one of them shows me an online article about it. And all that stuff that was happening while I was there by myself the whole week, I had no idea about this history. Then, I proceeded to tell them about what had been happening and how I didn't know that the block or the campus itself was haunted. Needless to say, it spooked them out a lot. But hey, at least I've got other people living in the block now too, huh? Over the course of that year that I spent in that block, I experienced many more paranormal occurrences that I haven't included, but yeah, that place is most definitely haunted. There's always a, a really strange feeling there as well. Funnily enough, it's right opposite a cemetery, and I often wondered if there was some sort of connection to that too. During the time that these events had taken place too, I was very comfortable with paranormal experiences, so I didn't really um, get too scared, I guess you could say, but it always was a, a little bit creepy. More creepy than other places for sure. My sister always locks her doors. She got a job after college in the Washington DC area, big city. She lived alone with her catch during 9-11 and the sniper shootings. She obviously kept her apartment doors locked. She kept her car doors locked. She locked her windows, locked everything in fact. So what are the chances that the one night that she left her back door unlocked, that would be the only night that someone would try to get in? It's weird, right? So, getting tired of the big city stress, she bounced around a bit before settling in with our paternal grandparents in southern New Mexico. She took care of grandma, who was going blind, and helped clean the house and run errands while she looked for a job. After she found a good job nearby, she was able to purchase her first home. She still held the grandparents on the weekends until grandma got to needing a care facility. My sister got herself a little dog to go along with the two cats and... One night after taking the dog out for this evening piddle, she looked up and went to bed. Like I said, she always locked up. She slept deeply until the early morning hours of dark 30 when she heard her toilet flush. Being such a locker of doors, she was unprepared for an actual breach of security, so kicking her blankets off, she stumbled stupidly and with much anxiety into the kitchen to face her intruder unarmed. A six foot tall, 250 pound male she said huh dad is that you and he said sorry i was helping to load up grandma and grandpa's furniture into the moving truck i got done late and needed a motel before the long drive home but thought that i'd see if you were still up your lights were out but the back door was open so i slept on the couch the little dog whimpered a bit my sister looked down at the confused face and said, You, you're the dog. You're supposed to tell me about these things. The two cats already knew who dad was and probably just shuffled behind the dog's back anyway. But in all of these years, we've never figured out exactly how the back door got left open that one night. And the thought that it could have been a stranger is creepy enough to keep her locking her doors religiously. And my doors too. A few years ago, I was staying in a, a family resort in Turkey with my parents and sister. I was 17 then, and one night after we had finished dinner, I wanted to go upstairs to our hotel room to get my jacket. The guy that entered the elevator with me was already giving me some weird vibes, but I shook it off. He got off at the same floor as me and also followed me down the path to our room. I eventually started running because I felt so uneasy and he was just getting too close. So I reached our room and thought that that was it, just a, a really weird encounter and perhaps me overreacting a bit. I had sufficiently calmed down and was actually going to leave when our hotel room's phone rang. I picked up, assuming my parents had a phone call from the reception or something, but instead it was a male voice telling me how sexy I looked and how much he wanted to have his way with me. I hung up immediately and started crying. That dude had been close enough to see which room that I had entered to be able to make that call. The phone rang a few times more as well, but I just didn't pick it up. 
I must have been in our room for a long time too because my parents had gotten worried and they had come upstairs to check on me. I explained what happened and when the phone rang once again my father picked it up. There was silence on the other side and the call was quickly ended. I was terrified that I'd see the man again but thankfully uh, I didn't. I kept looking out for him at the pool, at the restaurant etc but I never saw him again. My parents told me to brush it off and that such creeps are everywhere, but at the time and at that age, it really shook me to the core. I was horrified about what may have happened if I hadn't started running that day. And to this day, I, I hate walking down long hotel floors on my own. It just fills me with dread. This night, I was hanging out with three friends, Sarah, Nick, and Mary. We were celebrating Nick's birthday at his place, which happened to have a hot tub in the backyard. After a couple of hours and a, a couple of too many beers, we jokingly suggested skinny dipping in the hot tub as some kind of birthday present. It would have probably stopped there too if it wasn't for our drunkenness, but eventually, we just said, let's do it. Now, for context, Nick's house was by a forest and was very isolated from neighbours. Adding to that, it was maybe past midnight and anything past the Christmas lights of dubious quality that were spread around the yard was basically pitch black. Being absolute cowards, going out there without Nick's parents' home would have been unimaginable if it hadn't have been for the wonders of inebriation. So, semi-reluctantly, I followed my friends into the night with a towel on my shoulder. We reached the hot tub that was worryingly close to the edge of the woods and we started stripping. Everything was fine for the next 30 minutes or so, apart from the occasional branch cracking. But we were having fun, telling stories or rambling about stupid stuff and the fear quickly faded away. That was, until a deafening shriek came from the darkness of the forest, lasting for about 5 seconds. It sounded like a human voice too, but it almost didn't sound like a person. We all turned livid, being silent for what seemed like hours, and I even saw Nick lose his boner in a matter of seconds. We didn't dare try to look into the forest, except Mary who just grew a pair of balls out of nowhere and picked up her phone to use the flashlight. We couldn't help but follow the light too as she pointed it at the forest, who seemed unaffected by it as if the darkness was sort of swallowing it. But there was nothing. As we were about to stop looking though, the void stared back at us. Mary shined her light far behind Sarah and it reflected a pair of eyes and a white form in the distance. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. We instantly rushed out of the tub without giving a single thought about gathering our clothes. Mary and I screamed, apparently her balls had been blown to smithereens at this point, and we all ran towards the back entrance as fast as possible. Nick immediately got a knife while we locked every door and window. We wanted to call Nick's parents or the police or anyone, but our phones were over by the forest where we'd left them in our clothes. Seeing no other choice, Nick put shoes on and made a run for it. He managed to get his phone, but he'd heard loud breathing coming from the forest, meaning that whatever or whoever was there hadn't left. And what followed were the worst two hours of my life. Nick got his parents to make their way home, handed us towels, and so we could finally cover ourselves. We gathered in the basement where there were no windows. We spent most of the time in silence waiting for something to happen. And half an hour in, we heard another shriek, more distant this time. Only this time, it was shortly followed by knocks on the door that couldn't possibly be Nick's parents. Sarah actually started crying at this point, but... Thankfully, nothing else happened after that. The parents arrived and allowed us to sleep in the basement for safety. They hadn't heard or seen anything and were pretty sure that we just imagined stuff. We hardly slept that night and once the morning came, we went out to get our stuff. The phones, keys, wallets were all there. The only things missing though were Nick's shirt and Sarah and Mary's panties. I wasn't wearing any that night. So that left us with two possible scenarios. A weird, pale pervert spied on us in an isolated area deep in the woods. Or whatever other creepy stuff roams in there just decided to spook us that night. I often wonder 
which one it was. I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I looked young for my age and my family and I lived out of town, about eight miles out. Our little community was also next to a highway. The school bus would drop me off two blocks away from home and one day I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me, so slow that I figured that they were just looking for a house or something. I ignored it and walked to my house but that was just the beginning of it. Consistently, this truck would follow slowly behind me. After a couple of days of this, I walked into my house, I was always the first one home, and looked out the window. And inside was an older man and a black lab. He was staring at me, idling outside inside of his truck. Then he just pulled away. It was at this point that I decided that enough was enough. I told my parents, of course my sister was quick to jump in that I was lying. I will admit that I had a habit of telling stories at this age, but my mum thankfully believed me. She drove me to the bus stop the next morning. The red truck was there, across the street at the gas station, pointing toward the bus. I got on the bus and my mum decided to drive around the truck. She described the scene this way. The man was disheveled and dirty, hunched over his seat just staring at the bus. His license plates were caked in mud, so she couldn't make them out. It freaked her out so much too that she called the police and the school. I went to school that day and was quickly pulled into the office. The man had apparently been spotted at the school waiting in his truck. That day I rode the bus home but this time the truck was parked alongside the street. Which meant that I would have to walk past this man's driver's side door to get home. I debated considering running for it. Apparently this man was getting desperate now that he was spotted. But a police car showed up and I talked to the policeman. They went to go talk to the man but as soon as they started to get closer, he quickly pulled away from the curb in high speed and absolutely flew down the highway. I never did see him again after that and although I do think the police pursued him, I don't believe that he was ever caught. Because of this experience, I'm extremely guarded and paranoid with my own daughter and her soon-to-be sibling. The world is a, a terrifying place sometimes, especially these days, and children go missing so easily. I don't like to think about it if I'd been grabbed. I wouldn't be here sharing this if that was the case. My kids wouldn't exist. I truly think that I was lucky, and many children aren't. Growing up, I, a 29-year-old female, I actually lived in a haunted house. My sisters and mother all have an affinity for the paranormal, but I am too scared to allow myself to see it. Every time something unexplainable happened, I would always run away, ignore it, pretend it never happened, and just try to distract myself. Examples would be hearing my parents call my name when I know that I'm home alone, hearing sort of clicking noises that are coming from the middle of an empty room, clearly seeing someone standing in the corner as I pass by, doing a double take for them to just no longer be there. But one night when I was about 19, I was staying up late watching cartoons and just drawing. It was about 2 in the morning when my dog picked up her head and started looking towards the middle of my room. She bolted back as if something freaked her out and then immediately got off my bed and ran to the middle of this room, barking hysterically at something that I couldn't see. This immediately gave me goosebumps and I called my dog back multiple times, trying to get her back to my bed and make her calm down, but she just wouldn't stop. And then, it happened. I felt something and it was honestly like someone squeezed my legs. I had both my legs out in front of me, sitting up and they were under blankets. I felt it, but I thought that I was imagining it at first, but then... I looked down to see, clear as day, two large hand-shaped imprints over the blankets, slowly running from below my knees up to my thighs. My lights were on and I was sober, I was fully awake. There was no denying that it happened. I couldn't move, I didn't know what to do. Not that I was experiencing sleep paralysis, I was just panicking. 
I started crying and called for my younger sister sleeping in another room next to me over and over until she woke up and came to my room. My dog didn't stop barking too until my sister came into my room. I had a, a full-blown panic attack after this and it was terrifying. Another strange factor was that around this time too we had a peeping Tom that was leaving lots of evidence of them looking through our windows, trying to open windows and even getting into our cars. He would leave handprints and forehead prints on our windows and I think that I may have woken up while he was watching because he left a stepladder. He grabbed it from my side yard and it was against my window on multiple occasions. Another time we found bare footprints outside of our window in the mud after a rainy night but we never figured out who it was, but all my sisters and I have since moved out and my parents haven't noticed anything else weird happening since we moved out. They didn't really notice it before either, I was the only one finding or pointing out the occurrences I guess, but I know that these are two different situations, but sometimes I feel like they are related somehow, because they both happened at the same time. Anyway, I moved out a couple of years later with no reoccurrence of that night, it was one of the scariest experiences that I've ever had and when I talk about this story out loud, I still tear up and get emotional about it. I do still experience, well, some small things depending on where I live. Thankfully, the house that I now own does not have any weird vibes or things happening after a couple of years of living here. <laughs> 